Boom. Day six. Day six. 11 days of reefing. We're over the hump. Mm -hmm. We're over the hump. Halfway Ep there. Episodes looks like 23 through 28 That's today. Six episodes we're covering today. All mm -hmm. about carbon, GFO, refugiums, filter socks, filter pads, mm -hmm. ozone. I mean, you name it, we're covering it today. All right, you know, and rightly so, Doug Brunson's wisdom today is uh, <laughs> through the years, I've never stopped doing things, thinking about things, and I still think young. Yeah. So uh, you might think you know anything about carbon, you might think you know everything about bacteria, you might think you know everything about filter socks, uh, but today... We, st we still don't know. We're definitely light years past where we were on many of these things uh, since uh, uh, 2015. Uh, trying to think young, trying to <laughs> never stop doing things, never stop thinking about things. Thanks for the inspiration, Doyle. All right, so uh, episode 23. All right, cleanup crew, how many do I need? That was uh, 52 weeks of reefing, <laughs> uh, what we talked about way back 2015. Today, core belief. Core belief on cleanup crew, the C, un uh, lowercase u, uppercase c. Cuck is uh, a cleanup crew is so much more than snails and crabs. That's the core belief. Yeah. So much more than snails and crabs. If you believe what we believe, uh, <laughs> join us for the journey. Otherwise, if, if you think it's snails and crabs only, uh, check out because uh, there's nothing here for you. <laughs> uh, no, uh, cleanup crew is uh, so much more than snails and crabs. And yeah. I think we'll just dive right in, man. I mean, what matters most here? Number big one, one, big one. Go for it. This was the one, uh, one that we picked up from WWC. In like, we've always, we've kind of always done it, but then really put a, a name to it. Utilitarian fish, meaning uh, what matters most. A tang gang is the perfect cleanup crew. Is the cleanup crew for most large algae mm -hmm. uh, from day one. Uh, you put them in there before you kick your lights on, uh, and then they help keep all the nasties at bay. And then throughout the life of the tank, they're just there working because. You know, that's what, the, that's what they were intended to they were put on this earth to do, is pick algae. Utilitarian fish. Uh, fish that serve a purpose mm. and earn their living in the tank, right? So we've all seen it before. Uh, you've seen it in the wild. You've seen it in your tank. You know, tanks just all pecking away all day long. That's all, all they day. do is eat algae off of surfaces. <laughs> uh, don't be surprised uh, if you take them out, all of a sudden you have an algae problem. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. That was like one of those aha moments where like somebody just says it the right way. Tang gang, yep. utilitarian fish. Yep. Uh, well, that's what we put fish in here for. Yeah. Uh, it expands upon that. It's like mandarins going after parasitic copepods. Uh, it uh, is wrasses going after coral mm -hmm. pests. Mm -hmm. uh, it's you know a lot of times if you can put these things in there beforehand. So utilitarian fish being. I got an Aptasia eating file fish, but I didn't wait until I saw 18 million of them in the tank and then expected him to somehow solve that problem. Right, right. What I did is I put it in there at the beginning. Prevention. Yeah, and so if he happened to stumble upon one, it was gone. Uh, and so I will never even know they're in there because they were eating them from yeah. the beginning. Yeah, same thing with like a, a lot of flatworms and things like that. You put one of those uh, wrasses in there. Um, Probably why we saw, you know, nudie, uh, the emerge the nudie eating, um, the Monte eating nudibranx in the 160. Uh, we saw the emerge of the acro eating flatworms in the 160 is because uh, we didn't even know they were there to begin with. But then all of a sudden, when you take that fish, that utilitarian fish out, when we catch the six line wrasse, when you pull the file fish out, the uh, file fish were eating the acro eating flatworms. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Explosion. So yep. they, you know, a lot of times they're just taking care of the problem before, you're, before you even know it's a problem. So in our case, uh, this tank we know full well has Monteita nudibranx in yep. it. We have uh, we know full well that uh, there is acridian flatworms in it. 100%. Uh, and if you look behind us, you can say, does it matter? I don't. I don't see where it's affecting a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, part of it is uh, the, you know the whole approach of the KZ approach of the uh, coral booster combined with the flatworm, uh, flatworm stop. stop mm -hmm. uh, hopefully making the tissue unpalatable and tough. Uh, but also combined with that, predators just swimming around all day, that's, man. Rass is just eating for. them, dude. Uh, yeah. Manually blowing them off and you know taking a little bit of care. Once they're in there, they're in there. There's not much you can do. I'd imagine that uh, the tang gang or utilitarian fish wasn't really imagined. Like when I first got into the hobby and I'm read every time I read, you know, the CUC and they're like, all right, establish your cleanup crew. And it's, uh, it's all part of the process of setting up a, a new tank. Uh, 
nobody uh, nobody said these things like tangs and, and fish and those are part of your cleanup crew. Uh, and I don't know, it, this, that's probably what drew the parallel for me was when WW, when we were in that four month cycle and they said add fish that are going to help you out when you turn the lights on. And that's when it, it touched for me and says, oh, well then, yeah, cleanup crew. Uh, makes mm -hmm. sense because uh, most of the other advice you would get in the past was load it up with snails and load it up with crabs. And that was your cleanup crew. Here's the problem is, is like snails and crabs can only get to certain areas. Like they're not crawling out in big peninsulas. And if they are, they're, you know, taking a nosedive. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it's just like you see a snail and a crab, it just isn't is limited by where it can get to. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> the tang, though, is just swimming around all day long, you know, hunk and pecking. All right. So uh, another one, what matters most is uh, copepods for micro algae. Right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you can actually see in mic like in microscopic shots of them eating tiny little bits of uh, filamentous algae and stuff off of the rock, you know. So, uh, for me, I'm sold now all the way. That, on on uh, pods. Pods, yeah. You probably want to wait until there is some food source for them to add uh, add them. I wouldn't put them in a tank uh, as a preventative measure because they'll probably just starve right. and die. Right, right, right. Uh, but you know, as soon as the tank's been up, the light's been on for a little bit, probably a good time to add them. And this only makes sense because it's like an army of tiny little bugs getting into places that your your tangs can't get that your snails and crabs can't get they're in that's where you know they primarily live in the Be in the rocks in the surface eat it before you ever even see it yeah. uh, and on top of that they <laughs> will replicate very quickly in a reef aquarium uh, meaning that uh, as long as they're not predators eating every last one of them uh, but in, in most rock structures today, that'd be hard to do. Right. Uh, uh, as long as they are uh, uh, are able to replicate, they will replicate based on the food source. Hmm. So as much food as there is for them to eat, the faster they will grow <laughs> and take over the tank. So uh, copepods, uh, part of the cleanup crew, think about them in that manner. Uh, probably the best place to get them from my, my mind would be algae barm. But uh, we also haven't given up on crabs and snails. Those are a part of the cleanup crew, too. You think of, like, big picture to little picture to even smaller picture. So, like, tangs to snails and crabs to copepods. Uh, they're just taking care of a little something different. So, like, a lot of your detri uh, detritus and some of the algae. Uh, we believe they matter most as well. Mm -hmm. So detritus, they're walking around, picking up everything that's on the ground, you know, in the sand, uh, picking Uneaten up sand. food. Uh, so snails and crabs do have a serpent purpose, but again, if, I, if I'm thinking about snails and crabs, like, A, they can't get around to the same place where the fishes can get, and uh, they also can't replicate in the same fashion uh, that uh, copepods do. So, like, you're kind of stuck with how many you have. Now, some snails do, uh, like a trochus snail will actually replicate itself in, in a uh, reef aquarium if you're lucky. Mm. Uh, you'll end up with lots of them. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, for the most part, though, I would put snails and crabs in terms of fighting algae and pests as like number three, yeah. Uh, which is the total opposite of they what I was told one. in the beginning. They were all that was all we was ever talked about when I first got in. Was, hey, your cleanup crew is snails and crabs. End of conversation. Mm -hmm. Here's places where you can get them in packages, but the mm -hmm. pa the cleanup crew packages from a lot of those places that were selling them didn't have these other factors in there: copepods, tangs, and you know a bunch of other stuff. So. I mean, I guess I feel the exact same way I do about crabs and snails as I did back then. I just feel better about utilitarian <laughs> fish and, and uh, copepods. copepods. So uh, I, I feel like the s snails and crabs are going to do about what I expected them to do back mm. then. Uh, I have more faith uh, in uh, the tang gang and uh, copepods. Sand sifters uh, being, uh, you know, cucumbers, sand sifting stars, yep. nocerious snails, uh, uh, sand sifting fish. Diamond uh, gobies. Diamondback yeah, gobies, yeah, things that do okay yeah. in a reef tank as long as there's enough food uh, or that you supplement their food. Uh, those things do a pretty good job of turning over the sand. Uh, you know, like, depends on how aggressive uh, the specific animal you get is uh, <laughs> and how many you have. But uh, in some cases, they can be the solution to keeping the sand clean mm. uh, or at least portions of it clean. I mean, taking the, taking away a lot of your own need for me or your time and effort and put into maintenance into vacuuming the sand and stuff like that. If your detritus is constantly getting rolled over and exposed into the filtration and up and out, uh, that's just less of a, you know, ticking time bomb specifically in the sand that you might have. 
Yeah, so Should like those disturbed. little Nasaria snare, uh, snails are a little, little uh, like <laughs> they, snorkel. Zombies, I call you them. Know, they come the, up out of the ground, out of the sound when yeah. there's food in the tank. Yeah, but they're just going around in the sand all day long, just cleaning the sand out, eating up the detritus mm. in there. Uh, oh, yeah. And uh, the same thing with uh, your you know, sand sifting diamondback goby, just going around, sifting all the stuff out. And those fish tend to do best when there's a lot of waste in the tank, you know, so mm -hmm. that they can you know, pick up the waste food and stuff as they're going through it, as well as an established, uh, you know, sand. Uh, uh, they don't do as well with a brand new sand yeah. bed, but. I imagine, and we didn't hit it here, uh, but now that I'm thinking about it, I would imagine to some degree, not that it's uh, a, not that it's a pest that you want in your tank for cleanup crew, but bristle worms, I bet, to some degree are mm. in there digging up detritus, eating things like that too. Yeah, I mean, so to those, some, sometimes to the point where they could just get out of control, but. Yeah. So people say that all the time, like that bristle worm is just fine. It's just eating detritus and living mm. in there doing its thing. Except uh, for when it's not. Yeah, you know, that, that's like generally true, but like also it's a surefire way to like get stung all the time too. So, uh, <laughs> they if they're in there, they're in there. But yeah. if I gave me an option, I would choose not in there. Yeah, me too. Uh, but I've, like, are I've, they I've, terrible? No. No, I've had been stung, stung with some a few times, but I've seen them to uh, plague-like proportions, mm -hmm. like the drains where they're just falling out of the drains. There's videos <sighs> where it just give you nightmares. Yeah, like, you watch nightmares. them. Yeah, so especially if you saw it all macro. <coughs> uh, all right, so another one, though, that people didn't think about as a cleanup crew uh, mm. is bacteria and biome for slimes. So slimes, I'm just using a generic right. term, like, you know, slimes on the rock being uh, like uh, cyano, dinos, uh, dinos mm. all of those things. Uh, well, you know what, man? There are absolutely tools for uh, the slimes that they'll like, will beat those things back. So uh, if you add biome, like things that live on the rock will protect their own, you know, yeah. essentially territory on the rock uh, and bacteria will eat up you know, cyano and those other things on the rock. All those bacteria are in competition with each other. If you can get the upper hand with a, b a bacteria that helps you versus the other nasty ones, uh, then win-win. We're going to dive into bacteria even deeper here in a couple episodes later on. But uh, mm -hmm. yes, bacteria and biome. Yeah. Uh, Vibrant is uh, one of those ones that really came to mind from uh, for our testing this last couple, uh, last couple years. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on top of that, UV won't stop any of these things, but it'll slow the spread and give the uh, cleanup clean crew on many of them the upper hand. Yeah, right? a couple of days ago we really dug into UV sterilizers and things like that, but uh, it's not the answer, but it sure can help your, C, you know, your CUC. Yeah, so think of CUC, uh, your cleanup crew now, I think in you know today's age, the new evolution, uh, I think most people that are really, really into this would agree, the statements we made here, that utilitarian fish for pests, uh, tang gang for uh, uh, mm -hmm. algae, you can prevent, not necessarily prevent that you'll ever see those uh, uh, pests like acridine flatworms or uh, the nudies or even the zoanthid nudies or yep. any of that stuff. Yep. You just might not even know they're in there because they're being eaten faster than they replicate yeah. or cause a problem. So uh, cleanup crew for pests, cleanup crew for algae, copepods for microalgae, crabs and snails for detritus and a bit of algae, sand sifting fish, mm -hmm. cucumbers, stars, nasarius snails, all that stuff for your sand, bacteria and biome for the slimes that can uh, go in your tank. UV, supportive, won't prevent it, but may give the upper hand to the cleanup crew. So if you think about cleanup crew now keeping your tank and having organisms that live, uh, do work for a living, <laughs> those are all organisms that will do that for you. On different scales too, yeah. Yeah. from macro to micro. Uh, mm -hmm. They're working in all aspects of your tank. It just feels like even like when we say it aloud, like a little bit more of an intelligent approach instead of just using one hammer of crabs and snails. Yeah. Uh, something like really is trying to address what the issues are and then go tackle them using, uh, you know, livestock. Well, that leads into the hard lessons here because mm -hmm. I was a victim of the hard lesson of the first one. Uh, so hard lesson when it comes to cleanup crew, we don't want you to learn, we don't want you to learn on your own, learn from uh, our hard lessons. We have hundreds of dead crabs and snails don't help. So I fell victim to this one uh, actually a couple times. I was setting up my, uh, it was after my 40 breeder, I was upgrading to a 60 and uh, I was uh, 
you know, cleanup crew, cleanup crew, cleanup crew. And so I went on a buying spree and just, I was like, well, more is better. Uh, I just don't want algae and everything like that. So uh, let me buy a pack of like 20 or 30 snails and let me buy a, a pack of like uh, two dozen blue leg and red leg hermits and throw them all in there. This should never be my problem anymore until they start dying because there's a lack of food. You know, and so if you think about it, like, let's just pretend that uh, I threw a hundred snails in a tank that we knew full well beforehand were dead. It's a just giant nutrient bomb, mm. right? Yeah, so, yeah. Like the, but, like, it doesn't really matter, though, if it died today or it died, uh, you know, over the course of the next couple of weeks as they starve out. Uh, it really doesn't matter which one of those things is true. It, it's going to have the same net effect in a month. Right. Right. So you would never pull, pour a hundred dead snails in there because you know exactly what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. no, don't do that. <laughs> you know. Uh, and so yeah, I, I think that we call them nutrient batteries. You know, essentially what they're doing is, is during that time when they're starving, is they're eating themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. They like you know when you're on a diet, you essentially eat yourself, <laughs> uh, and then you still put that waste out into the water right yeah. and that was what they were doing so I, I don't know I'm sure a lot of people like to sell packages of a hundred snails and a hundred crabs and a hundred whatever and but you know big tank you know for that think about how many you really need uh, uh, for your application uh, I, I'm not gonna say a hundred is a wrong number I just don't think that a hundred snails or if a hundred snails doesn't do your job that the problem was uh, that you needed 300 because it's probably not the case. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, also, a hard lesson is uh, many of the snails can't flip themselves over. So if they fall off that rock trying to seek the top, yeah. uh, you actually have to go in there and flip them over or they're going to die. Yeah, I'm worried about this in my 60-gallon tank in my office right now. I have three of the biggest Asterina snails I've ever, I've ever seen or laid eyes on. And they're literally like massive, the size of my palm of my hand. Uh, but heaven forbid one of those things flip over and I'm not around to flip them back over. Uh, oh, dude, it'd be drop, like dropping uh, a chunk of food this big. Like a there. massive chunk of food. Oh, he's, they're almost to the point where you could saute them up and eat them. <laughs> if you it's probably if you're into snails. They are massive and they don't allow, some of them are well known for not uh, tipping themselves over. Uh, Trochus is one of the big ones uh, that are that Mexican turbos I think have a hard time also, but Trochus snails are the ones that I, I found are the, e the most likely to be able to grab onto something and flip itself back You can over. see them when they're on their back going like this, flip, 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 and really throwing themselves around to get righted. Trochus snails seem to have mm. uh, be willing to eat more types of algae in my experience mm. as well, and they happen to breed in many tanks oh, and yeah. successfully be able to replicate themselves. Tons of tiny little but guys. I think that message, though, that we've been given on that has made them scarce. They're kind of hard to find, and you oh. often find, uh, like, Little teeny little, ones little now. Teeny trochus. Yeah, they're really hard to get them from breeders, and I don't know. Like I know Algae Barn and ORA works at it, but sometimes they just stop breeding for whatever reason, mm. and it's hard. Yeah. You know? So, uh, yeah, I, I I know that many snails can't flip them over. Uh, for me, trochus snails are probably the best for that purpose. I, uh, there's all kinds of them out there, you know, they probably have different reasons, but I primarily consider myself as a Trochus and Nisarius snail person mm -hmm. uh, for two different reasons. No yeah. urchins? Oh, so urchins are really good algae eaters. They eat a lot of coralline algae. They also hitchhike your, all of your things around they the They push tank. everything over <laughs> is my problem, yeah. Yeah, I mean, even those uh, really nice pin cushion, though, like blue ones that... Uh, um, uh, one of our guys breeds, Chad, breeds mm -hmm. a bunch of ur pin cushion urchins. Really awesome at cleaning the tank, but dang, I'm tired. I've had some, I've had a bunch of them before, and I'm, I'm tired of seeing my, you know, $100 stick frag that I just glued walking away from walking where I glued stuck it. To it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, they tend to bulldoze stuff, <clears throat> and some of them, yeah. you know, cover themselves up with uh, coral and stuff and drag it all over the place, so... Uh, I will say urchins are really good if you are trying to beat something no, difficult. You, you have a problem, existing problem, try a few urchins in there. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Uh, hard at lessons is adding all of uh, the cleanup crew too early. Like yeah. You can't really add the fish too early because you can feed them a variety of ways, but the crabs, the snails, all that kind of stuff, even bacteria, potentially the copepods, if there isn't food for these things, they're going to die. 
That's why I put uh, the utilitarian fish uh, at the top of my cleanup crew rung now is because I can add them from like day one. As soon mm -hmm. as the tank cycle and everything's over and we're ready to go and I'm on my uh, on my journey to turning on my lights and everything, I could have fish. I can already have them. Mm -hmm. uh, and that sort of goes back to what I said about losing a whole bunch of snails and crabs before is that was the first thing I added thinking that I'm going to get the leg up and ultimately fail. True. Mm. Uh, another uh, hard lesson, uh, I think, for the community here is actually the tank police have pros and cons. So the tank police are out there to help p protect the tanks and tell people the, you know, the challenges of maintaining this fish mm -hmm. and don't put it with this fish and that fish and the size of the tank. Well, that's helpful to some degree, but it wasn't. It was never that you couldn't have this mix of tanks. It's just how, what order do you put them in and when do you put them in? Uh, in vast majority of cases, uh, and then also size. like the size piece. Yeah, that size was one of the biggest. Uh, anytime you heard about. Anytime I heard about the Tang police, it was mostly because somebody put a Tang that will knowingly get large, all, all of them do, uh, in a small tank like 40 gallon breeder or 60 gallon cube, and then everybody comes out and you can't have that fish in there. The, the, the guy's this big. What do you mean I can't have him in there? Mm -hmm. uh, when he gets bigger, we go mm -hmm. take him out. We did that for the E-170. Yeah, two years from now. Especially easy if you can take the whole aquascape out in one piece. But yeah. uh, if you as long as you plan that, for that, I yeah. think you're all right. Hey, you can catch them too, man. It's just a little different, a little, yeah. little hard. I, I think Nios just came out with a cool, uh, they have that little dome that the fish will go in, and then when you let it pull the magnet off, the dome flips up and brings it oh, to the not, ceiling. Oh, uh, I forget the company that does that, but it's not not Nios. It's oh. a different company. I forget their name. Oh, is it? All yeah. right, my bad. Yep. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, they have, uh, there's uh, you know different fish traps out there. So tank police, good, man. It was a step forward for us, but it was also holding us back in some areas because uh, ultimately, I want a successful tank. I got a 40 breeder. Feel free, man. Throw the little tiny, find the smallest yellow tank you can find, or, or uh, you know, or uh, tank, yellow, a, yellow's uh, a little hard. like a bristle tooth uh, white tail tank yeah. or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, find a small one, and then if you outgrow it, either by then you might want a bigger tank, or you know, trade it out to fish store. I mean, there's probably there's cases like a, a 10 gallon tank. Yeah, mm. maybe not so much. Yeah, there is definitely a like, limit somewhere. Yeah, uh, I think 40 breeders fine. Yeah, I mean for little guys. I mean, it really depends on the size of the fish and yeah. your willingness to how often you want to trade them out. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> uh, definitely there. Yep. So, uh, I don't know, that's cleanup crew. There's not really a lot to it other than think about it more holistically. It's just not a bunch of snap crabs and snails. Mm. It's tang gang for press, or tang fang for algae, utilitarian fish for many pests, copepods, microalgae, yeah. crab snails, detritus, yeah. sand sifters, cukes, stars, nasaria sails for sand. Bacteria for and biome for slimes. UV is supportive of the whole process. Uh, so what's next? Next, we're talking about episode 24, uh, carbon, GFO, and filter media for a clean, stable reef tank. So we're talking all of those uh, reactors and things that you put in your tank to keep it clean, crystal clear water, phosphates down, the whole nine. Uh, and we have a really simple, like, six-word core, uh, five-word core belief. You know, we were kind of just trying to explain what these things we did in 2015, and today I'm just going to be a little, we all bit, know more, what it does, a little right? bit more blunt. Yeah. yeah. So carbon for sure. Yes. GFO sometimes. That's the go. core belief. <laughs> carbon for sure. GFO sometimes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, right, what, so what matters? matters most? What matters most about carbon, GFO, and filter media these days is uh, I want crystal clear water. I don't want yellow. And you can, uh, if you, especially some of the tanks here, uh, we walk around and if the lights are off or the light shining through the big window from the uh, outside in, and you catch it, you catch the tank just right. It's completely yellow all the way through. Mm -hmm. Nasty looking. So yellow, a few reasons. One, it will uh, filter the color uh, out, out of the tank. So your corals will not look as nice in yellow water. And you may not even know your water's yellow. Uh, easiest way to do it is just turn the lights off. And if you look through the water, it looks yellow. It, it should be either crystal clear or have a green kind of tinge to it. Because of the glass? Because of the glass. Yeah. Depending yeah. on uh, the low quality iron. of glass mm -hmm. you have. But it should be crystal clear for the most part. If it looks yellow, it's because the water is yellow. 
Uh, simple, simple as that. So yeah. this is the reasons I care. A, the yellow filters out the blue and different colors when I'm looking at the tank, so it doesn't look as good. Mm -hmm. uh, a, I do see the tank when it's off, and now that I know what yellow is, I just know it feels dirty. Yeah. Right? yeah. And B, the yellow pigment is pulling out uh, uh, par from the water. You know, I, I think your recent test had it at what, like 15%? Uh, in, in a controlled environment, it was like 10 to 15%. In the actual tanks, it was negligible. There's still a lot to test because I didn't have any change in the tanks. So oh, it, it, there was some, uh, we're going to try a few different more tests to like clarify some answers on that one. But your initial test uh, lost par. My initial test in a controlled white and uh, white uh, acrylic environment lost a par. Uh, but yeah, we'll find out if the rest is true in the actual tank. In an but. actual tank. I'm, I'm excited <laughs> to explore that. But yeah, three things is uh, A, I don't want it to look dirty. B, uh, I don't want to lose any par, and C, I just know the water's dirty when it's yellow. And uh, easiest way to know is when the lights are off. And so and it stinks. Carbon, we'll just get rid of it. By the way, uh, you run some carbon in the tank, uh, and especially in a reactor where you actually mm. have to force the water through it, yeah. uh, it will polish the water up. And the reason that you know it, and like this is a fun experiment to do at home, is. Pour the water in the bucket and sit it next to that new fresh water. Uh, like when you're doing a water change, you know, pull five gallons out, put it next to your new fresh water. One of them is crystal blue yeah. in the bucket, yeah. and one of them is dirty yellow yeah. uh, or a version of that. And then if you run carbon through it, you'll actually see that it processes all the water, cleans it up, and it is now indistinguishable from the mm. brand new water. It's crystal blue. And you know, five gallon is really the bucket that you want to use on this one because it's about the depth of the tank front to back. So when you're looking through it, you can actually see the yellow. Because you're if looking you get through a, about a foot and a half yeah, of water. Because if you get like a yellow little white container or something like that, you might not be able to see it as easily. Oh, you wouldn't be able to see it through like a cup of water, a couple of inches. Yeah. But like when I'm looking through my tank, I'm looking through probably 18 to 24 inches of water mm -hmm. and the tint just gets stronger and stronger and that's why when you look through the side of the tank too i'm looking through four feet of water it really, uh, looks, yellow. really <laughs> looks yellow that way uh, uh and especially because the back's usually black it's kind of hard to see sometimes in but if you look through the side you'll definitely see it but in the yeah. white bucket it's probably a foot and a half to two feet deep uh, you'll see it for sure 100 percent uh so everybody wants crystal clear water i don't know anybody doesn't uh it's just Sometimes you just don't know what you got. Once you do, it's kind of hard to not want to fix it, especially if the solution is three bucks in carbon. <laughs> uh, and three bucks once a month, who cares? Yep. Uh, the next, uh, what matters most, though, is also kind of closely related to this. You may not know. Yeah. Uh, if your water's yellow, there's a probably a chance or likelihood that you also smell your reef tank. So odors and just the smell of a reef tank, whether it's the, orga it's the organics in the water, your skimmer, or this other things, but uh, carbon can help with odor. So one of the things that matters most, I don't want to have odor, uh, odor uh, from my tank at all. Yeah, I mean, I don't want it, it, often they have kind of a green smell, like a LG yeah, type smell, you know, like. Definitely walk it, when you walk into the studio here where there's big, like six, five or six big giant tanks, mm -hmm. it smells. No, you can, you can, there, it, like, stink isn't the right word. No. But, like, I know there's you know there's an aquarium. aquarium in the room. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, three bucks of carbon? Uh, well, no. And, and so the, here's the piece is, like, for most of us who've been living with these tanks, we don't even know anymore. Uh, but uh, when you have guests and stuff over to your house, do you want them, like, the first thing they do when they walk in the room? Something smells yeah. like yeah, No, I don't want that, ever. <laughs> uh, it, and like, it'd be different if I had to put an elaborate system in to prevent it, but if mm. it's three bucks in carbon, I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and three bucks of carbon, like it, it could be, it will work best if you're pumping water through a reactor, yeah. but it could be literally just taking a bag of the carbon and put it in a high flow area, like in the baffles or your sump or mm. something, and uh, boom. You no longer have to worry about this. Uh, even better, that uh, that little BRS mini reactor solves mm -hmm. a lot of people's problems. Like you don't need, you don't necessarily need that big giant ten inch one. That little uh, five inch uh, uh, BRS one holds a, almost. Uh, it's like a cup and a half, or maybe a cup and three quarters, which solves a large amount of uh, volumes of tanks. The reason I like that little one is like often, you know, you're gonna mount it to the bigger ones to the the 
cabinet and then you're gonna like you know have it uh, go down in there with a pump yeah. and all that stuff with a little guy you can actually just throw the pump right on the side of it and the exit right down there it's only this tall and just set it right down in the water and never even know it's there set it in an open chamber you want to clean it you just like unplug the thing and take the whole thing pull it out you flip the flip both of the tubes up and it doesn't spill while you're walking clean really I love easy the mini. i love the mini uh, if you don't want to unplug it you can just, just push the connect fittings you can just pull the pump off yeah i Easy peasy. Uh, that little guy is what I would recommend for a vast majority of people. Doesn't tumble. Little cartridge, really mm -hmm. easy to manage. 100%. Okay. Uh, also, what matters most when it comes to carbon, GFO and filter media is carbon is the first responder with uh, suspected toxins, uh, whether it be coral warfare, you did a whole bunch of trimming, uh, something got into the tank, you know, aerosols and cleansers in the air, or some uh, one of your family members or children might have got a little something in the tank, you have stuff on your hands that you didn't rinse off before you put your tank in, uh, carbon can be one of the first responders there to get that thing out of the system. I'd say if I look at my tank and it looks like garbage, uh, and I suspect a toxin, the first thing I'll do before anything else is change out the carbon because yeah. it could remove a vast, uh, just a, a, it's like an entire swath of potential contaminants that go into the tank. Mm. Uh, and uh, like if it feels better, I'd probably stop right there. Three bucks in carbon, solve my problem. Yeah, which is uh, another reason why like, you, this sh is, it's almost like having a first aid kit on hand when you're uh, around your house or when you're you know, like out camping or outdoors. Like have carbon on hand in case something gets in the tank because the chances that something gets in the tank are uh, very likely. Eventually, for yeah. sure. Uh, so I would say like it's it's solved it for me so many times over the years like something just doesn't look good change the carbon and and you know tomorrow everything looks fine good to go yeah. uh, and i'm not talking about like a single coral because who knows what happened to a single coral but if like all of a sudden eight corals don't look good mm. uh something's pr you know either the chemistry's wrong there's a pollutant in the tank there's like a whole variety of different things uh, you know, I guess if you're asking me in this series, like I'd probably check the, you know, salinity, right, like, right. alkalinity, all that yeah, kind of there's stuff. There's some too. big ones that you check. Uh, but like from a perspective of a, you know, concern about a potential pollutant, an unknown one, you know, it could have been in my hand. Somebody could have mm. sprayed something near the tank. Who knows? Uh, carbon, knee jerk. Yeah. Uh, having it around, even if you don't care about the smell, even if you don't care about the yellow water, having it around just for that purpose. Now I will say. You could probably go to a fish store and go buy it uh, if you need it in that case because, you know, the fish store is always available. But uh, not if it's, you know, 8 p.m. on Sunday night, you know. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Uh, it's such a cheap thing to have <clears throat> around and, and, and good. So uh, next one. Uh, what also matters most is that GFO, we're talking about GFO now. GFO is very useful at fighting algae. It does a really good job uh, because it attacks phosphates, a big source of fuel for algae. Open and honest, I don't know why GFO and carbon, just because they're both filter medias, get consumed into, the, always into the same conversation. <laughs> it's usually because they're probably they're used together. Yeah, you, know, you, you can mix them together in a reactor, and uh, yeah. why, why not talk about same them together? Same equipment, but gotta they do totally different things. <laughs> yeah, hundred yeah, percent. Yeah. Okay, so GFO uh, is very very useful at fighting <coughs> algae, right? So it, it's it's better actually that at preventing algae from ever being a problem in the tank than it is at, at trying to suck out all the phosphate and fight an existing algae problem. Mm. Uh, it's, it's one of those things where an ounce of prevention is always worth a pound of cure. Right, right, right. right. Uh, but uh, I, I have used it, I've, I've seen it in so many instances, where, like you can tell when the GFO is depleted, not because the phosphates are rising, but because the algae grows faster. <laughs> it's because you, like, huh, I've only cleaned the glass every uh, week or so, and now I'm cleaning it every three days. GFO, yep. it's like its own sign. Yeah, it you is, know? 100%. Uh, and the way it does it is uh, uh, phosphate and ni or, uh, algae in the tank requires a source of phosphorus and nitrogen to grow. If we limit the phosphate all the way down to close to zero, it just doesn't grow as fast. If it's abundant, it will grow abundantly. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, thinking about that, I will tell you there's some downsides to this uh, in our hard lessons that we'll share as well, but there's no question GFO is really, really good at preventing algae outbreaks in the tank. It is a useful tool at fighting them, but not as good. Yeah, 100%.
Uh, also, what matters most, periodic GFO may be the solution to below 0 0.1 phosphate, but watch out for higher nitrates. Yeah, so here's the, the problem is like, these things are like, <laughs> when I add food, I, it's like, I'm gonna make this up because it's kind of close to this, but it, every food is a little different. It's about 10 to one ratio or so of nitrogen to phosphorus is being added to the tank. Right. You know, like, so if I had one part per million nitrate added to the tank, I might have a 0.1 phosphate, mm -hmm. which both those numbers are okay. Now, uh, if I though chose to have uh, 20 parts per million nitrate, well then the phosphate- The 10 to one ratio there is- I'd have two parts per million phosphate, which is not okay. <laughs> right? no. Okay, and why not okay? One, you're gonna grow algae like nobody's business, mm. uh, unless it's a super duper established tank and coral lines cover and everything, yeah. tons and tons of predators, tank Your gang. All corals that. are actually sucking yeah. up more than the GFO would be. Yeah, so in that case, I don't know, but the corals are definitely gonna grow fast, slower, because the phosphate poisons the surface. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, Jen told me here that phosphate, uh, high phosphate, Number one cause of issues for her with uh, euphelia dropping heads. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I didn't I've never heard that before, but the, it's the people that do this for a living that I often trust the most. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they have connected like, those dots multiple times. Well, yeah, because they're like like the amount of euphelia I've owned is in the hundreds. Uh, the amount of euphelia that she's touched is in the hundreds of thousands. <laughs> you know, so uh, you know, I, I think. I would I'd listen to that piece, mm. and and it's kind of the opposite of what people say though of like dirty tanks or better tanks for LPS. Like, did that's just I I don't believe that uh, <laughs> are at all. You know, dirty tanks just synonymous with uncared for. Yeah. A lot of the deep waters that like a lot of euphilia comes from, uh, they're, they're clean. not not heavily polluted. Yeah. Uh, clean. Not rich in nitrogen and phosphorus. Are there little areas somewhere? Sure, but most of them no. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I think it's interesting. So in this case, periodic GFO, GFO use might be the solution that if you really don't care about nitrate that much and you're letting it go up to five parts per million, maybe you're going to let 10, maybe you're going to let 20, mm. but you actually want to keep the phosphate below 0.1, GFO, lanthium chloride, those types of tools might be the best solution for when you really care about one but don't care about the other. Hmm. Yep. Um, what matters most is mixing the two versus tumbling instead of tumbling. Uh, half a lot of time, uh, you know, I I used to run heavily heavy carbon, ten inch canisters of carbon, two and a half cup or I'm sorry, GFO, two and a half cups of GFO. Make sure that thing is tumbling. I want zero phosphate, zero nitrates. That was back in the day uh, when that was the goal was to attack all of them down to zero and keep a completely sterile tank so nothing algae looking uh, ever grows. Um, but now you know. You, get into using GFO as a, like goes back to our core belief, carbon for sure, GFO sometimes, uh, with that sometimes mentality, uh, you don't need as much, and actually just mix the two together. Put some, uh, you know, what is it, one third to two, th one third GFO to two thirds carbon, or even a little less ratio than that, uh, better than having two reactors and tumbling. So there's, I guess there's a couple other pieces to this. Is like when you're tumbling it and you're running the reactor, there's no question that's the most efficient method. You know, mm -hmm. you're keeping all of it, moving surface area, all the stuff. But, and you're pumping water directly through it. Uh, but like, I don't really need to strip it out. Especially like, if, I'm, if I've been maintaining this stuff generally well, like I don't want to let it rise and then strip it out, and let it rise and strip it out. And that's the only reason I like really need that level of efficiency is if I want to strip it out. Yeah. If I just kind of want to like, you know, continually remove some of the phosphate from the matrix, uh, mix it in with the carbon. You know, forget tumbling it. Tumbling's only so that the little uh, like pieces don't, don't rust together yeah, essentially yeah. and form a big block in your reactor. But if you <laughs> separate those pieces with the carbon, you don't have that problem. <laughs> Uh, is it the most efficient way to do it? No, mm -hmm. but I may not actually need the most efficient way. Just a little bit of bump uh, help with my, my phosphate levels. In fact, I'm gonna tell you this. I don't think that I have tumbled <laughs> GFO for 10 years. Oh. I've always been mixing it with my carbon. I, I, I don't think I've ever, I've tumbled it and 
as long as I can almost remember now. I'm, Ten years is a strong word. Maybe it's only six. I don't know. <laughs> but like, it's been a long time since I got underneath there and I was tuning, tinkering tuning with it, the trying right to figure flow. out how to you know get it to, to tumble. Which right also mode. changes over time as it gets bio fouled and filmed and everything like that. Then you got to go readjust and yeah. Is it better? Sure. Uh, should I just do I prefer to move it, mix it with the carbon? 100%. <laughs> uh, all right, so in that spirit, carbon GFO filter media clean stable reef tank, hard lessons. Uh, this one's kind of been mm. interesting because over the years you've heard people say that uh, carbon may cause HLLE, head lateral line. Uh, uh. Erratic. E. I don't know. Oh, we've always e called it for? disease. Disease. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know. Well, yeah. and HLLE, uh, so it might cause uh, the uh, head and lateral line disease. Uh, somebody tell me what the E is. Now. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, I've Erosion seen the experiments where that has happened, you know, uh, like they're pretty old, uh, but like they exist. The, pre the reason that like, like for me is like I've been using it here oh, erosion erosion, erosion. Yeah. Head, head and Thanks, lateral Dave. line erosion thank you uh, so the reason I've been using it here or I, we never really talked about it here is because we use carbon on I don't know man sixty tanks here nobody has any problems with head and lateral line erosion right? yeah uh, and it's been decades and like I I all these tanks have tangs in them dude yeah. all, all of yeah. them so and various degrees of all the types of tangs as well so, so that's just it's not just running carbon you start to think about oh, so if it's carbon related what's the difference between the carbon in the systems that are seeing the hlle versus the carbon in the systems that aren't because uh they may be the same um, as far as like the same species and whatnot but one's having one problem one's not having uh, one's uh, having the other problem uh dust is could very well be the, the, the culprit. The dusty finds, yeah. Uh, like not rinsing it out or using uh, carbon that is just like the lignite, the bituminous of the world's very, very dusty, soft carbons. Some of them, yeah. Uh. So here, here's the thing is like, if you go into a room and you say, all right, how many of the thousand people in the room have had a, a problem like this? And, you know, 10 raise their hand, well then it's just some weird anomaly. If 100, they raise their hand, but 900 don't. It's what's different about that 900, yeah. that 100 there, yeah. right? Like, what are they doing different? And the only thing I can tell you here is that we use here because it's what we use the rocks. is the ROX carbon, mm. which is super duper hard. It's really easy to run, rinse. Doesn't have the dust, and it's a pharmaceutical grade intermediary, meaning that like it strips out. Uh, it's designed specifically to desert, to remove contaminants from water for pharmaceuticals. A lot of the other carbons Not release are, anything into the water. A lot of the other carbons are designed for air, aren't they? Not. They're designed for air. They're also not designed for like, you know, applications that are like, you know, critical to organisms health per right. se, you mm. know, so, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, I will say that hard lesson is I could think that it's possible that this is actually true. Uh, it hasn't ever been true here in decades of 60s and 10, I don't know, even the more number of sheer volume tanks, I can't mm -hmm. remember. So why is that? And my guess is that it's probably the group of people that are experiencing this are using, using super soft carbon, not rinsing it well, uh, and getting lots of dusty fines, or they're using poor grade carbon, and the poor grade carbon has some kind of contaminant in it that is causing the problem. Mm -hmm. I don't know, uh, but hard lesson. I, I think that if you were ever to run into that problem, I, and you were using, you know, poor grade carbon, I'd switch it out right away, uh, for sure. Uh, um, you can take this next one here. Okay, so this is the same spirit. Actually, is hard lessons is carbon could add stuff as well as remove. So carbon's obviously designed to soak up all the contaminants from the water. Right. Yep. Uh, but where it know, comes from, is that what? It, yeah. Yeah. The, it, it's wood, it's peat moss, it's- Coconut shells. Coconut shells, it's bituminous coal, it's mm. uh, all kinds of different things that come out of the ground or ha broken up. Naturally have impurities. Yeah, and they all have been cleaned in different ways. Some of them use like phosphoric acid. Yeah, We've never yeah. used that uh, in the reefing industry. Right, right, right. Uh, some of them are, you know, cleaned with steam. Some of them are cleaned with hydrochloric acid, which is clean unless it's coming from a waste source of hydrochloric acid. <laughs> so, like all of this stuff, it, it really carbon. can affect it. Like we've seen it, man. Like you can run a, a magnet over some of the cheaper carbons, and it picks the carbon up. Oh yeah. Yeah, you know, like there's metal in there because this stuff is mined out of the ground. In fact. <laughs> 
some of them we actually put into a microwave and you could watch it spark uh, because there's metal. Because there's it. metals in there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, don't do that, by the way. It's probably super dangerous. Uh, but uh, <laughs> on our front, like that was one of the things we wondered, man. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> as goofy as that sounds. Uh, yeah, but like know that the quality of the carbon you use uh, certainly matters, and that. It comes out of the ground, is what it is. Yeah. Uh, or a peat, or a tree, or a coconut, or whatever. Maybe some phosphates. It's the amount of care that goes into it. Yeah, there was that conversation of carbon and phosphates for a while, but... Minuscule. Yeah, minuscule, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, another piece is n under no circumstances Don't ever do this. Don't tumble carbon. Uh, I, I mean, I think every single episode, if you go back to any, any BRS to TV, BRS TV Investigates episode, or through the years, if it's about carbon, it always comes out of the of our mouths. Do not tumble it. Do not put it in your filter socks and let to your uh, water drain over the top of it because it's moving around. Do not put it in your reactor and let it tumble. If you mix GFO with your carbon, do not uh, uh, the you don't need to tumble it even though your GFO is in there. Don't tumble the carbon. This is where the dusty fines come from. It will turn to dust uh, if you do any of those things. And one of the ones that uh, like is a pet peeve of mine is is putting that carbon into the filter sock where the water flows over and rushes onto it and turns it over. Mm. I don't know why that's a common practice, but it shouldn't be. Yeah, uh, it's even from even if you have an immediate bag and put it in your filter sock, there's like some air pockets that could probably get in there and still tumble it. But That's a fair point, though. Like, if you were to get it into a tight little ball in the media and like, bag. tie it in really good into that media bag, so it absolutely couldn't tumble, maybe you could put it in your filter sock. But, but still, but we're pounding it in the in the uh, here in a couple episodes. We're going to start talking about filter socks and filter fleece rollers and. You should be changing your filter socks every three days. So yeah, how right. are you going to keep the carbon in there all the time? Well, but actually, so even though I just said you could do that, but why? Yeah. Just put it in another high flow area of the tank, like baffles. You know, put or it in between the baffles, and when I say put it in the baffles, make sure there's ample size water that could go around it as well. You're not clogging the baffles, but like if you put it in between the baffles, water's going to flow through the carbon mm. and and do it just as good without being pounded and turned into uh, dust. So. Yeah. Anything that you think that would make the little granules rub up against each other, they're just going to grind each other to dust. Avoid it. Avoid it. Avoid sure. it like the plague. All right. Yes. <laughs> I mean, we bring that home. So, because you know, here's the problem: is I see it still. I still see it in videos and stuff. Or like, dump some carbon in my face. Somebody sock. told me I should dump. I should tumble my carbon because it looks cool or something. And then, and then like the whole tank sometimes can turn. I've seen people add carbon to the mm -hmm. overflows because uh, somebody gave them that advice and their overflows happen to turn over pretty rapidly. And then the whole tank just gets covered in black. Ooh, that can't like, be good. Yeah. Okay, For it wasn't the carbon that, that did that, dude. It was semi, the application of it. Semi-permeous pores on the corals, the mouths of the corals, the fish, the gills, the eyes, the... Ah, dusty fines cannot be good for anything. They're breathing that water. So if we create all those dusty fines and flew it up in here, I would not want to breathe this. No. No. <laughs> yeah, so they're breathing well, that's this. Well, you know, kind of, that might stem from a problem of talking about carbon and GFO in the same uh, breath every time they're mentioned is because GFO, you, you tumble, and you want to tumble it, and carbon, you don't. Yeah, uh, there you go. All right, next one. <laughs> uh, hard lesson learned. Absolute zero phosphate, but high nitrate may cause issues, it's still an open dialogue. There's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of speculation, a lot of anecdotal you know, uh, experiences with the uh, pegged zero or stripped zero phosphates, high nitrates, or these imbalances between the phosphates and nitrates that might uh, lead to something like dinos taking over, bacterials like cyanos, or so these different uh, types of things taking over, uh, where they thrive in those environments. So. Uh, at all costs, uh, absolute zero phosphate and, and high nitrates is not a goal to shoot for. Yeah, <clears throat> if you had to ask me, I, 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 I guess I tend to believe that this is true yeah. in some fashion. I, it's, it's hard to really you know, pinpoint because most of it's just plausible theory at this yeah. point, yeah. right? But there are lots of organisms in the ocean and there are other areas where if either nitrogen or phosphorus is uh, scarce but the other one is in ample supply, 
certain organisms will thrive in that environment mm. and others won't. Mm -hmm. So it only goes to, uh, you know, help assume that in the tank that that would probably be true as well. Like if total zero bottomed out nitrate or phosphate from GFO and tons of nitrate might actually, you know, be ideal for some organisms in the tank and probably the things that are able to scavenge. Undesirable the ones, yeah. Undesirable yeah. organisms in the most part. The only problem is, is like, you know, you can, it sounds plausible, you know, I get it, but does it really apply to dinos? Does it really <coughs> apply to the, it, the species of dinos that you are happening to run into? Right, right, right. Uh, yeah. Is it, like, it's really easy to take that information and then just like blanket apply it to everything, yeah. you know? And that certainly isn't true. So. The I just would say that if you have that really out of whack is zero and high in the other one, don't be surprised if that causes you problems. And you definitely have seen people who have fixed that problem and fixed the problem in the tank. So I, I would use it as a tool to say, if I run into that, here's one of the steps that I should go after. Well, that's a, the end of the, or the second sentence in this hard lesson is that it's still an open dialogue. There's mm -hmm. still a lot to be learned and tested and learned and tested some more to actually see what this causes in our tanks. So this is something we could totally do in BRS Investigates mm -hmm. is like, you know, start a Pay. sterile new yeah. tank where there isn't a lot of organisms <laughs> competing with each other and the thing that has the most resources will almost certainly win. And we could just start them. You know, one with high nitrate and phosphate, one with zero, zero, one with uh, high phosphate but low uh, uh, nitrate, and Opposite, the inverse. Yeah. And then when I say one, I usually mean two of each, yeah. so we can see re replicates of the, the, the experiment. But, uh, I mean, I would love to do that. I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how helpful that will be to people in the end, but like, what will come out of, you know, a controlled environment to experiment like that? What, would you expect to see? I don't I'm just, I think every time we talk about testing things like that, I start thinking about logistics of how the tests will be conducted. Like you're going to have to separate them so that they're not contaminating each yep. other when they're coming up and skewing the results and this and that. But it would be really interesting to see if there was a uh, definite dinos and definite not dinos or definite cyano to definite not or when, some weird uh, algaes or something versus none. When the results are repeatable, oh, yeah, yeah. that's when they're the most believable. Uh, so <clears throat> yeah, I, I, be wary of uh, zero, high, high, or high, zero, or zero, zero. And I'm not as afraid of zero, zero uh, in the tank from a perspective of as it will help pest down, as long as I'm finding ways to give a source of nitrogen yes. and phosphorus yeah. to both the fish and the corals, mm -hmm. often being the particulate foods, uh, mm -hmm. being amino acids, being you know other methods of making sure Nutrition. there's adequate nitrogen and phosphorus in the tank, kind of like the ocean. The ocean is pretty close to zero, zero. It's the fact Tons. that there's so much prey in the water mm -hmm. for it to catch. Tons of available nitrogen and phosphorus. Yeah, it's in a, just in a different form, which is an organic form that captures it. Mm. So, uh, mm. all right, another hard lesson is uh, it takes a lot more GFO to get the levels down than it does to keep it there. So once in a while you run into somebody like, I don't know, I'm using so much GFO and I can't get the levels down. Well, uh, if you fed so much that you landed yourself one day at 20 parts per million nitrate <laughs> and two parts per million phosphate, it's going to take a lot of GFO to get it back down, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Don't be surprised. It's going to take different than the amount it would take to keep there. So let's imagine just for a second that uh, I kind of let my phosphates get uncontrolled for the last year, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden I find them at two parts per million, which is some insane level, and I need to get it down. Well, that's the result of 12 months of uh, phosphate you know, build up. Yeah. So the amount of GFO that it takes to keep it down based on the amount of food I put in uh, will be 12 times that to get it down to begin with. Yeah. You know, so if it takes a half a cup of GFO to be able to uh, get the GF or the keep the phosphate levels down, you know, consistently, it will take for it to cover that for a year. It will take 12 times that. It will take six cups. <laughs> which a reactor doesn't even hold, right? right? Uh, and you probably don't want to strip it out that fast either, right? 
My personal opinion is when you run into issues like this, mm -hmm. uh, instead of just piling GFO and more GFO and more GFO, the reality is is if the GF or the phosphate that's high, you probably have it's probably an artifact of a variety of maintenance issues. The nitrates are probably skyrocketed mm. as well. So just water change it out. Do a handful of 30% water changes until it gets reasonably low and then use the GFO to maintain that new level. Don't try to just throw chemicals at the tank to solve all the problems. Mm. Sometimes you just manually need to like get it out of the tank. Oh, and then by the time you get it down to the manageable levels, you're probably uh, at an amount of GFO that you just mix with your carbon and you don't need like a separate reactor. Yep. I mean, that's just enough to keep it where you want it. Very mm. true. Next. Uh, next hard lesson learned is consider water changes for the initial reduction. You kind of <laughs> hit, you just hit on that. Uh, but that is, uh, uh, instead of burning through GFO, because GFO is extremely effective at pulling out phosphates. I mean, we're talking like, like this. <laughs> Not instantly, but I mean, if, I'm, if I put a, two cups of GFO in, in, to attack a two part per million uh, uh, phosphate problem, I'll probably see that gone in, very rapidly. Um, I'm going to double down on this if you have really high nitrates and like if you have really high nitrates and really high phosphates, it's an <coughs> overall pulse on the fact that the tank is just generally polluted. Mm -hmm. uh, like that's the true of a tank, it's true of the ocean. If you went to an ocean and you told any marine biologist that it was filled with nitrogen and phosphorus, they would tell you that water is polluted. Yeah. Right. Uh, and so it's the same thing in your tank. So if you're there, man, don't just try to solve the phosphate issue. Uh, do it intelligently. Solve all the issues. Water changes, a few 30% ones a few days apart from each other will get you there. Then use the tools to help keep the water not polluted. Mm. And then regulate, find out why it's... Uh rising so fast. Uh, maybe regulate a little, little feeding or upgra upgrade your filtration approaches. Yeah, so that's what we've said in the past actually, which is uh, if your nitrates and phosphates are rising, it's because of one, two th one of two things. Mm. Uh, either your filtration isn't uh, good enough to keep up with your food, or you're dumping too much food in. End of story. Yeah. Uh, that's and the, the answer, only reason. And the answer, is, and the answer isn't, uh, well, I'm going to stop feeding you so you stop using the toilet too much. Mm -hmm. so yeah, if your problem is a dirty bathroom, <laughs> it doesn't mean starve your family is the solution. <laughs> yes, that's a, that was a funny one we said uh, the other yep. day. Uh, but yeah, I, I really, really think that you can solve either one. Is You can up your filtration game and it actually solves. But the only problem will be is if you just like decide that I don't actually want to try to peg nitrate at one and phosphate at point one, but I do want to keep phosphate point below point one, but I don't really care about nitrate as much. Well, it's going to be really hard to do. So allow the, maybe the nitrate to rise a little bit and then use a tool to keep the phosphate down. Mm -hmm. You see them do it at WWC. They're using a the lanthium chloride. You can use it here with GFO or lanthium chloride. Pick your pleasure. Yep. All right. What's next? We are moving on to episode 25 of the BR 52 Weeks of Reefing. This one called Going Beyond Filter Socks, the Thieling Roller Mat. You know what's funny is this is 2015. I'm pretty certain this is the first experience with a roller mat that we ever had. Yeah, you just came back from uh, Inner Zoo and after finding it, didn't you? Hey, I found, look what I found. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I, I'd seen it, I think it's called a Genesis or something, a long time before that. And it had like this little water wheel. It was really designed for ponds more than anything because it was so huge. Right. It had a bunch of metal parts and stuff on yeah. it. But, uh, eventually, Ethelene made this uh, very similar version, but instead it used a flow switch and was way easier, easier to install. Uh, I say easier uh, loosely, but easier than the Genesis. <laughs> uh, okay, so... Uh, I believe. That was our first experience with the, that roller mat is like 2015. So what do we know now? Here's where we are today with our core belief. And we're going to have to say this twice, maybe even three times. Manual fleece rollers are the future. Manual fleece rollers are the future, right? Okay, people. so people, you're gonna manual hear this. Fleece, rollers, <laughs> fleece rollers are the future. Builder socks should be dead to all of us. Dead to and all I'll of tell us. you why, you're gonna, by the end of this, I think you're gonna agree. Like, uh, yeah. 
Uh, Somebody like, give me a manual fleece roller. And the only reason I say manual is because uh, electrical ones are uh, presumably much more expensive. Uh, but uh, the uh, fleece roller, if you did it manually, could probably be about the same cost as the uh, the filter socks. So there's going to be a lot of advantages. Think about it for a second. Oh, man. That's a big one. All right, so what matters most is fleece material is the best for people that know they uh, overfeed capture it whole. And by fleece material, I mean it could be fleece on the uh, roller, it could be fleece in a filter sock, it yeah. can be anything. But it's mechanical filtration. If you feed a lot, the best way, like an overfeed, by the way, mm. is uh, the uh, best solution for that is fleece or filter socks in rolls or socks. And the reason I say that is because capture it whole. I mean, yeah. it has no chance to break down. It, uh, and you're pulling it out in real time before it even gets the chance, uh, bam, easy peasy. Okay, so the answer to that is, well, why are you overfeeding <laughs> then? Well, I don't, you know, that's true, man, but I don't care. Some people just enjoy feeding their pets. They do. Right? Yeah. And that is, they like overfeeding, whatever it is, and the only thing they need to do is then compensate for the filtration to uh, Pull it out. fit that. If you ask me, I would guide you probably to feed as much as the animals need, not as much as you need. Yes. Uh, but uh, if, I can't get past that, there is a different solution. <laughs> and even for normal people, still, you no matter what you do, you will always have to feed more than the animal needs to make sure that it gets it. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. Unless you're like, <clears throat> there's some probably super elaborate way where that say, statement isn't true, but for vast, vast majority of people. And you watch it every time you feed. Yep. Stuff goes everywhere. How many of those did you count and follow to make sure that they actually went into a fish's mouth? Yeah, when well you watch it in the roller, man, I mean, you watch it literally roll the shrimps right out. There you it know, is. The little mice and shrimps are <laughs> rolled right out. The pellet foods that don't get eaten rolled yeah. right out. Yeah. You can see all the broken down food and poo rolled right <laughs> out. Same thing with your filter sock. When you pull the filter sock and you clean it, all the brown poo and shrimps dunk. and all this stuff, man, gone. Yes. You're, there, you're pulling it right <laughs> out of the tank. So uh, the best way to manage the fact that you may like to feed more than you should is fleece material, whether it be socks or rolls. Yes. And then uh, on the front of socks, uh, we're talking about what matters most when it comes to uh, filter socks and fleece rollers. Uh, filter socks changed every three days is the sweet spot. Every yeah. three days. So we didn't get a lot of advantage <laughs> out of changing them every day. We didn't get a lot of advantage changing. I mean, it was a little bit, but yeah. like not uh, huge gains. I, I mean, for my own personal time, that was uh, a, a net loss. Yeah. Uh, every two days, uh, a little bit of gain. But after three is where the stuff started to rot and then uh, just turned into nitrate and phosphate in yep. the tank. Yep. Uh, and so after, if you leave the filter socks in there more than three days, all it's really doing is capturing those turds and uh, the broken down food uh, or the food holes or mm -hmm. the shrimp holes mm -hmm. and just rotting in there. It's just turning nitrate and phosphate in there and you're just leaving it in there. I mean, there might be other reasons you have it in there to like pull out little particulates, the the visual pieces of floaties around the tank, yeah. but it like know full well that you're just letting all of it rot in there, and uh, this maybe is, something else will catch it later on. But mm. this is not the most effective way. If if, if you put, leave the fleece in there for more than three days, expect higher nitrate and phosphate levels. This is why a manual fleece roller is so attractive to me. It's that I can. Uh, I am 100% more likely to walk by, give the thing a little turn like this every three days uh, than I am to pull the socks out, get my new ones, um, put them back in, go soak these ones, then a day later go wash them in the tub and make sure that I don't want soaps on there and all. Uh, they're not disposable because they're too expensive. So, uh, man, manual fleece roller is the future. So, like, a lot of people think about it like, oh, there'll be like a little crank or something on this thing, and maybe that's true. Could. But, like, you can also just have a big wheel where it rolls just up and just grab the wheel and just kind of, yeah. one turn, There's done. Tons of, so, yeah. So, am I willing to go in the sump uh, and uh, twice a, a week grab it and just pull six inches out in, in two and a half seconds? Sign me up. Oh, for sure. Sign me right? up. And then am I happy that I don't have to go put the all, buy all of these socks and then put all of those socks and stuff in my laundry yes. and clean them? Yep. Or worse yet, just continually buy them over and over again. And they're not particularly cheap when you buy, you know, if you're buying, if you're buying them to be days, disposable, yeah, not, not cheap. Yeah, and like, I got to tell <laughs> you that my 
wife is not super happy about putting bristle worms in the wash machine. And so I, you I, better do that when she's not looking. And I don't want to go spend a, um, for a mini wash machine, the three, like three, five hundred bucks for a mini wash machine just for my filter socks. No. Like, <laughs> uh, and so like, if, if you can make it like automated, don't get me wrong. It's just that those things cost, that sump costs a thousand bucks, mm. right? So like, if you got a thousand bucks for sure, that's the way to go. I yes. just, it automatically just rolls and turns out in real time. <laughs> but if, you, if it's not, man, like, dude, just, just, uh, there's zero chance you're going to see me twice a week crawling underneath the tank, pulling all the socks out. I hate it. Going and finding some place where they're not going to mold or get stinky. I and, hate it. You know, whatever. Shove those new ones back in there and maintain it. Dead to me. I'd rather buy a better <laughs> filter. I'd rather buy a refugium light. I'd rather get a better skimmer. I'd rather mm. do just about anything in the and known to man than like go monkey around with that. <laughs> but I'm 100% willing to go throw a little wheel. Whoop. Yep, cranky, wheelie. I'm gonna be a cranky guy. If the hey, if you come out with one with crank, that's mine. The crank, <laughs> the crank is uh, Randy's version. Uh, either one, man, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. But like, just think. I think that is the future. I I don't even know. Like, once you say it out loud, like, I it's. It, it shouldn't be any more expensive. Mm. Like the design of the plastic, it's just a rod with a couple of rolls on it, and you fill it up. Like, what the sump should cost like fifty bucks more, maybe, and then you'll never ever be down there doing all this garbage. Yeah. yeah. Well, when you, uh, yeah, I mean, if we're talking, and that's why manual, because uh, when you start to add in the mechanics and the float switches and the different things, the motors and uh, things like that, that just increases that cost because there's a lot more, uh, more a lot more to it. You know, and like I think what comes to cost is like the only like last holdout. It would be like, well, is the fleece roll more or less expensive than maintaining my filter socks? My personal, I, mean, I my think personal you'd be time. I think you'd be surprised to find out how much it actually cost cost to run your uh, wash machine twice. You know, one with bleach and then one in a yeah, rinse cycle, that's the way electricity I would do it. and all that stuff. That's the way I did it. I think you'd be surprised how much it costs to replace all the filter socks as you're buying them and washing them. And I think you'd be surprised how inefficient they get over time as you just keep loosening the material mm. as you wash them every time because yeah. they're not the same after the single wash. That's, that's true. Uh, I, I think I think even if you didn't give anything to your own time and your own time was not a, even part of the equation, it's just minuscule <laughs> difference, <laughs> I, I, yep. I think. Ah. I, you know, be the whole, oh, that's so like once you say that out loud, like why the hell do these things don't exist in, like, uh, in scale? And uh, I don't know. There you go. Uh, next one. Uh, what also matters most is that filter socks are likely nutrient factories if you don't change them. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a BRSTV Investigates experiment on, uh, like, we were talking about the results, changing them every day, changing them every two days, changing them every three days, so on and so on and so on. And the further you got past three days, the more and more nitrates and phosphates they so came out. Nutrient factory isn't a hundred percent true. Not producing more, right? It, yeah, like your, the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus is one hundred percent dictated to how much nitrogen and phosphorus you add to the tank via foods, right? Yep. yep. Or additives, I guess. Uh, but here's why it will likely create if you don't change these things out, create more nitrogen and phosphorus in your tank is because the filter socks are going to capture all those little particulate foods, the mm. broken down pellets and all the other stuff. And a lot of it's just going to degrade down into nitrogen and phosphorus inside that sock. Yep. Some of it will be removed and the protein skimmer and stuff will pick it up. But what you're really doing is actually decreasing the efficiency of every filter that comes after those filter socks because the skimmer no longer has the ability to pull out uh, the little broken down bits of, uh, of mm. uh, pellet food. And the skimmer will absolutely do that. It's not just broken yeah. down protein turn into mush and stuff like that? Yeah, like it'll, it's soft. We've all seen the, you can, <clears throat> you can see like after you feed, like the broken down bits of pellet food mm. that like, it definitely removes. It doesn't have to be all the way down to a protein chain, you yeah. know? Yep. Uh, and so, like the filter socks, if you don't change them out, I think it's fair to call it a nitrate factory, even though it's not like technically adding more nitrogen and phosphorus to the tank. It is going to result in higher nitrogen, nitrate and phosphate levels in the tank uh, if you don't change them out and just let everything rot in there. Mm. Yep. I, I will also say that 
I think this is uh, in here about the skimmer somewhere. Oh, uh, well, we yep. can start saving money on skimmers and buying smaller ones for our tanks rather than bigger ones because we have an effective filter roller. Yeah, like you could have, like that's a good point actually. Yeah. I didn't think about it that way. Is if you spent uh, 200 bucks less on the skimmer, you got, you know, you got a smaller a skimmer. Fil filter roller instead? Yeah, and the filter roller is like easier to maintain. Yeah. You know, if you go buy like a, a <laughs> Thielene, like compact roller mat, like it just rolls the turds right out and you don't have to do yep. anything. Yep. Uh, skimmer, you're cleaning it, maintaining it, tuning it, you know. Pull it out like, every uh, year for full maintenance, clean the pump. Yeah, but what you've seen over and over again is if you have a really good mechanical <laughs> filtration, being fleece uh, of some kind, filters off manual or uh, 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 fleece rolls, uh, you don't need as big of a skimmer. In fact, the skimmer won't work anymore. And Royal Exclusive told you that very same thing. In fact, I, I, I implore everybody out there that uh, uh, either doubts this or wants to confirm it, go pull out uh, your filter socks out of your system and then watch how much better <coughs> the protein skimmer performs without them. <laughs> uh, you'll be, you might be really surprised. So uh, check it out, uh, share your comments and stuff with us uh, because everybody else wants to see as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say also uh, wider. Okay, so fleece is the solution, yep. uh, manual or automated, doesn't matter. This is the future of sump design. That it, will just like, and this is another one of those things where the reason it will be the future of sump design is if all of you agree and then demand it out of the manufacturers and start buying come. those solutions, they will start creating them. Yeah. If you don't Otherwise, ask for it, they won't make it. You're stuck with filter socks forever. Yep, <laughs> then we'll just have filter socks forever, <laughs> so be it, yes. Uh, I will also say that wider fleece is better. Wider is better, Pontiac commercial. <laughs> yep, wider fleece is definitely better, meaning like uh, in many of the, like built into the sumps, the fleece yep. may be a foot and a half wide or mm. a foot wide. Yeah, the trigger systems ones, your mm -hmm. Royal Exclusive one, uh, I just, you see, I, when you go up, when you go look at it, you're like, man, this has got to be way more effective than something that's a strip like this. Well, so what it is is like if it's if it's if I got a big square, you know, this big, well, it will last uh, about five times as long as a square this big, you know. And so mm. you'll see a lot of the roller mats out there now these days, or the fleece materials, is I mean they might be only two inch strips. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, like just yep. like really really tiny, and like don't be don't be surprised if this didn't really solve your problem and you're changing out rolls every single week now. Yeah. You know, like you yeah. just traded one problem for a different problem. If you quadrupled the size of that thing, you'd probably quadruple the amount of time in between changing the rolls out. Yeah, and so for that reason, like these things are way, way, way better when they're incorporated into the design of the sump than all of the aftermarket versions of it that are like trying to retrofit a sump to be able to use these things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hate to say that because nobody wants to replace their sump. Uh, not a single person no. on the planet is really wants that, to do that. We talked about that in the sump episode. <laughs> this yeah. is one of the hardest things to replace after it's in place. I don't know. I don't know how to address that, uh, but it, it's still fact. Uh, so. In that spirit, uh, wider fleece is better. Yep. Uh, most of the aftermarket ones are pretty narrow, uh, and uh, the ones built in the sumps are generally pretty wide, and they perform a lot better. That's the one I would choose. Uh, another thing that matters most when it comes beyond filter socks uh, is uh, adjustable water height is better. And these, uh, you look at these prefab or these ones that are built into the sumps, like your trigger systems, like the uh, Royal Exclusive that you have, the Dreambox one. Uh, these are uh, these are adjustable filters. Uh, I can increase the uh, water height, meaning more paper is exposed for a longer period of time, uh, probably saving me more time on my roll because it's not all just going out in one big failed swoop. Um, so. If I want to filter faster, or pull the pull the uh, the detritus and the food and everything, all the particulates out faster, I can lower the water level. Less paper exposed, meaning it gets clogged faster, and it's just constantly pushing itself out. So the faster it clogs, the faster <coughs> it will remove it from the tank. Right. If you want it to rot a little bit, like maybe you want some nitrate and phosphate in the yeah. tank, you're having a problem. There you go. Not having enough. Well, you can let it rot. So the, I think the easiest way to think about it is: imagine if this was the exposed area of the paper. This mm -hmm. will clog you know, fairly fast. So if the water level in the filter is only this high, this will clog fairly fast, the water, the water level will go up, float switch will hit, and then we'll roll up some new paper. 
well, what if we wanted to not use up as much paper and we're not really having problems with nitrate and phosphate? Mm -hmm. Let's expose had twice as much paper. Right. Now the water level will probably take two to three times as long before it clogs this filter uh, and what makes the water level go up, causing it to roll some more out. But like, what if we really want to save a lot of paper and nitrate and phosphate, all the rest of our filters? Well, now let's have it use the full sheet. Water level's up here. Right, this will take a really long time. You'll probably only roll it up once in a day yeah. uh, ish, uh, every couple days maybe. In fact, what it really will often do is just expose like a couple inches, and so the rest of it will stay in the water yeah. and it'll expose a couple inches. That Enough gets clogged to, yep. slowly, inches its way out of the tank. So, this is now an adjustable performance filter you know, based on the fact of the water height. So the best solutions for the fleece filters will definitely allow you to change, that water. change the water height in there. Yeah, absolutely. I love an adjustable filter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, another thing that matters most, we uh, kind of hit on this one a little bit, but built into the sump is better. It's true. Uh, uh, after that, I will say the Thielene Compact is uh, our favorite here. Yeah. Uh, people Seven. ask all the time, yeah, 750 XXL runs it. And I think a lot of the, you know, it has like a 500 gallon per hour around there, 500 gallon per hour um, max flow rate through it to, to be to be utilized. But when you think about uh, what we've learned about turn times turnover in the sump, 500 gallon per hour covers a lot of uh, tank sizes. There's a lot of these aftermarket things, and some of them are really complex. Some of them might look cooler, the acrylic or something. Some of them would take eight million screws to put together. Some of them, <laughs> like, some of them the paper is only two inches wide. Uh, you know, like, but if, if I look at all of them, and I have to say which one I think will, the goal for me is to remove nutrients and be the lowest maintenance. Mm -hmm. It isn't necessarily to be the prettiest option. Uh, if the goal is lowest maintenance and have it work and easy of install, feeling, 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 feeling. Yeah. Uh, like it has a little barb thing. You just put the you know your return right into the barb thing. The barbs are three different sizes, so mm -hmm. it really doesn't even matter. Like your one of them will fit. Regulates uh, the water level inside of its own body rather than uh, the water level. Like some of them, you have to put into the filter stock chamber. When your filter in your filter stock chamber has to be specifically designed so that there's enough water that uh, over the top or enough room for water over the top that that allows the mechanism to work this is all self-contained yeah it's it's and it like has a little clip that can go on the side of, the uh, side of uh, non euro brace glass it has a stand that just stands in there and so this is how far i'm going to go with how much that i support this thing is rather than buying like a plastic sump that has a bunch of uh, filter socks in it, mm -hmm. uh, I would buy a 40 gallon breeder or a 20 long glass aquarium and throw this thing in the other side and probably some aqua mesh on the other side to capture some micro bubbles and call it a day. I'm done. Yeah, <laughs> like it won't be as pretty as a super fancy plastic uh, sump, but it'll cost probably about the same and it'll perform way better. Yeah, uh, I'll have I'll have the type of low maintenance uh, mechanical filtration that pulls all of the hard turds and uh, whole foods right out of the tank, uh, and I don't have to worry about it mm. anymore. So, even though the glass twenty long or forty breeder may not look as pretty as a you know trimmed out acrylic tank. I'll probably be happier with it over time, and they'll probably cost the same amount of money. Function over form. Function over form. That was, uh, our, uh, that was our core belief in on sumps. On sumps. Yeah, function yeah. over form and bonus points if it is future proof. That was Which our core glass belief. box is future. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Uh, <laughs> there it is, man. Uh, we'll jump to the next one because it fits right in here, too, on what matters most. You can use two compacts. Uh, you've got a primary, a lot of people have a primary, secondary drain. Uh, you can tune your drains to actually run kind of the same and run two compacts. Yeah, you know what? I think you could even use, uh, <laughs> like if you had a, a one drain from the tank, there's no reason you couldn't just have two spouts as well. Uh, you know, you might want to try to make sure it's divided up a little bit, but yeah. uh, you can use two compacts. You also don't have to run them. Like you could have two returns, like one of them that goes through the, the filter and one of them that doesn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a system that has, you know, it's probably going to put all of the water through the filter two, three times an hour. It has many times to catch this. <laughs> uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to go through it every single time. Yep. All right, some hard lessons, though, with filter socks. What's the first, first one? First one we learned a hard lesson about filter socks is we didn't realize just how much socks were hurting the perf uh, the performance of the skimmer. That one, shoo, 
I, I don't know if any. I'd be really curious to hear out of you guys if you didn't put that connection together. I've either. Either. never, never put that connection together. Yeah, that like if you're <laughs> capturing all of the waste in those filter socks, and a you're doing a really good job of removing it. Well, there's not much fuel for the skimmer anymore. The yeah. skimmer is not going to perform well. In which case, you get a smaller skimmer that doesn't require as much fuel. Or I didn't catch that. If you're not changing out the filter socks, that like I kind of thought like, well, I break down a protein change or something in there, and then my skimmer would get it. Uh, but the skimmer removes so many things before it gets to that point that yeah. you're you know depriving it from. Uh, it's not true, and I will tell you the only thing you have to do to find out whether or not you believe this is true is go remove your filter socks from uh, uh, the little holes, and then monitor how your skimmer performs and how much better you can get it to work. Uh, you might be right, surprised. You might that, surprise yourself. You might say, oh, man, that changed the world the way that I thought about this. So a uh, hard lesson for me, again, shoo, I, I just, after <laughs> decades of doing this, uh, I didn't realize how fil non-maintained filter socks, actually maintained or non-maintained filter socks Will. were hurting the performance of the skimmer, and I might want to size my skimmer to that in either direction. Yeah, I'm, I would enjoy spending... Half as much, half as much money on a protein skimmer because I've got a double as effective uh, pre-filter before it, a mechanical filter. Yep. yep. I, I don't know a single. I don't. Know many people would say differently than <laughs> that. Uh, another hard lesson. This one's you. <laughs> uh, this one. This one is me, man. Like. The bristle worm thumb was a hard lesson for me, which is reaching uh, in the filter socks. You know, I reached in there one day and I grabbed the filter socks because the water was overflowing. They were totally clogged. I grabbed it and I pulled it out, and my full thumb was just covered in fuzz because there's so many bristle worms living in that uh, uh, filter sock, dude. And it hurt for like a month. You know, <laughs> I, I mean, like I got them all out eventually, dude, but like. I, that is like probably the number one reason why I hilt, hilt filter socks. Uh, like <laughs> me and filter socks aren't on talking terms. Uh, right, at, right after that, you know, kinda, so you know, consider when you grab them how you grab them because you never know what might be living inside that thing. Usually, there's a tab. Grab it by the tab. <laughs> I always broke the tab off because I needed to. Uh, it was easier to turn them inside out when I go wash them. Oh. So I'd cut that little tab piece out and then just leave myself to the to the wolves. I, you know, here's the thing, dude. It's, it's like one of those things, like, just because I was lucky for a while, it's just because <laughs> you're just waiting that day. I mean, I, there was lots and lots of times I changed out filter socks and never that problem. <laughs> it was just that one time, like, bam, dude, uh, and it hurt. Uh, all right, another hard lesson. Hard lesson is uh, filter socks and filter rollers might work too well. And that uh, we hit that one a couple different ways, but uh, to the point, so much so to the point that might uh, render your existing protein skimmer uh, obsolete or uh, very inefficient. Yeah, so it might work too well, and also in the assessments that you don't have any nitrate and phosphate in your tank. Could work too well, so where your refugium starts dying. Yeah, so like it's just really good if you pull out the turds and food before they break down. What's left? Yeah, and so <laughs> it won't get 100% efficiency, but you might find that this tank works. This for me, it's funny. Like it's the same story as the uh, refugium. Like we went into the refugium idea thinking, well, it's just kind of a poor, like partial thing, and then we found, yeah. yeah, well, done right, it it works too well. <laughs> too well, uh, right? <laughs> well, so the same thing with. The, the filter material. Sometimes, especially in conjunction with other good efforts, it might work too well. Mm -hmm. And it's super obvious why doing it poorly would have a totally different uh, result than doing it in an ideal manner. Yeah. Uh, hard lesson. Uh, don't buy a sump with socks if you don't want filter socks. Uh, this is one, hard. 160 was one. Uh, was You Come saw up. the video where we cut the thing off. We cut the filter socks off. Uh, mm -hmm. We wanted to try that uh, roller mitt. Yeah, uh, if you don't Actually, plan no, that on was to expand yeah. for the refugium, we had the roller mat in place yeah. before. If you don't plan on using the filter socks, uh, just try to find a sump that doesn't have them. The problem is, is like I guess Most the industry do. really hasn't caught up with this, and so a vast, vast majority of them have filter What's socks. A sump without filter sock holders. Uh, a good performing skimmer sump is what it is. <laughs> it's a fun uh, it's a functional over form. You know, the problem will be, A, you're just wasting space, but B, the way they're designed that way is they're going to trickle in there and be super loud. Mm -hmm. So, uh... If you don't use them, they're going to be loud. I mean, I guess you could consider using the, like, mesh filter sock. They will probably catch some of the water and not make it as loud. 
Uh, and they don't really you know, catch as much things in there. Uh, they only catch really big organisms uh, in the mesh. Yeah. So it won't catch a broken down piece of food, you know. But mm. yeah, uh, I think that if you don't want sump, there should be there, there should be more options out there for sumps that don't have filter socks. Uh, hopefully the sump manufacturers of the universe are, are hearing us and gonna be brave enough to make one. Hopefully somebody <laughs> will make start making more and more of the fleece materials because and when you look at it, there's nobody that has used fleece material, manual or automatic, that wouldn't say there's no reason for filter socks to exist any longer. I agree. Uh, I so, totally yeah. All right, right so what's next? Uh, we are talking about episode 26 in the 52 weeks of reefing. This one, how to leverage bacteria for a cleaner reef tank. How do you leverage bacteria for a cleaner reef tank? This was an interesting conversation even back in 2015. Yeah. But I gotta tell you, I don't know how, there's been an evolution that has happened between here and 2015, but there is a lot of naysayers. There mm. are a lot of resistance to change here. There is, uh, this one is a, a very interesting thing because uh, leveraging bacteria mm. for a cleaner reef tank. It's something I can't see. It's something that uh, it doesn't happen immediately. It's hard to wrap my mind around it's it. It's very and, easy and to accept it. Immediately go to snake oil. Yeah, 100%. Right? Okay, so here's the core <laughs> belief uh, with leveraging bacteria for a cleaner reef tank. Bacteria in a bottle might just be the next frontier. Mm. Wow. I'll say it one more time. Core belief here, everything we're going to talk about today, is bacteria in a bottle might just be the next frontier. Wow. In, in a lot of different factors. Uh, problem solvers, uh, mm -hmm. tank cyclers, uh, problem solvers for uh, bacteria, algae, all, kind, all kinds of problem solvers. You're going to hear today, like, solutions <laughs> to things using bacteria that you would have never thought of maybe before, some yeah. of you at least. So yeah. we'll, we'll share some of them. But the first one here is what matters most, is progress requires yeah. an open mind. Just because we can't see it doesn't make it, make it not real. Yeah, that's true. And uh, the biome conversation that we continually have and uh, we're progressing with the biome conversation has a lot to do with bacteria and things like that. There's these things that you can't see. Uh, but in current history, we're now starting to be able to test for and actually see some of these things and uh, diversities and whatnot. So, whole new frontier. So, you know what? I think it's some of the <coughs> bad actors that... Uh, actually like, wanting to sell you or actually selling you snake oil and saying something? Yeah, it's the bad actors that, yeah. that like destroy the pool, yeah. right? And so there's a couple of people out there that were totally willing to sell you snake oil, mm -hmm. uh, water in a bottle, there's nothing really inside or very little of anything effective. And then what that does is it takes for the people that are like, believe that and have detractors is you point to those things, you know, snake oil, garbage, 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 garbage. So the answer then it becomes is, is 100% of it garbage and snake oil? Is it, or is it that some are better than others and some might just be great, mm. right? And if we only point at the one end of the conversation, it will never go We're anywhere. We're not going nowhere. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna ask everybody out there to come along for the journey. Start with an open mind. So when we have this conversation, you know, we're having it today uh, in 2021. Yeah. Uh, this is a conversation from 2015. When we have this in 2026, uh, uh, the conversation should evolve. I hope so. We should be in a different place than we are today because I know for sure some of this is legitimate. Mm. All right. Uh, what matters most is that there's confidence in that there is such a thing as biome in a bottle. Uh, not confident which one's the best, but there is such a thing. Or there, and there will be uh, such things as biomes in bottles. I am confident that you will find <laughs> biome in a bottle, meaning that you can cycle a tank, not just for nitrate and or ammonia, uh, but you'll be able to cycle a tank in a way that fights off pests uh, with uh, either biome in a bottle or bottles. Or bottles, and It yeah. will be a really quick, high percentage, easy solution. Uh, I believe that some of them probably already exist. The community just mm -hmm. hasn't embraced it entirely yet. Mm -hmm. 
I am not confident yet which one is best. <laughs> no, we're uh, actually in the, kind of in the middle of some testing like that. Well, s sort of. Uh, we have done tests like that. We're going to probably re we're going to revisit those tests. I think right now we're doing biome on various types of medias and rocks and yeah. stuff in twelve different tanks. The next stage will be. All right, All how do we do the same thing with biome in a bottle? Does any of it work? Do which ones work better? Mm -hmm. We'll find out the answers to those questions, share them with you guys. And then what we'll do is, all right, now that we know what the medias work, what kind of biomes in a bottle work, how do we use that information to create the 95% success rate for anybody that decides to start a new tank? Man. Tank's smooth, it's easy, has very few pests, very few problems, easy ride that none of us ever had. Never, nobody has you, had. You know what I think of is, uh, I saw this thing on uh, Tony Hawk, and he's like, <laughs> Super pissed about the fact that everybody is doing, you know, 360 kick flips or whatever off yeah. of uh, uh, a, a half pipe into a foam pit. And he's like, dude, when I wanted to do a trick for the first time, I'm going to look drag. down that half pipe. I know full well I'm going to get a mouthful of coping. Uh, and I'm going to hit and I'm going <laughs> to do it 20 times. I'm going to break my arm trying to do this yeah. thing. It doesn't matter. I want to do it so bad. Now you get to you know practice the rotation six hundred times memory. into a foam pit, and then go do the actual trick afterward. Yeah. Like yeah, I can see uh, why. I, <laughs> I, I guess I'm going to be bitter too, man. All the challenges that we had in reefing, <laughs> like we're going to like dispel it all. Like here's a biome in a bottle. Here's the path. Uh, you'll never have any. Go enjoy problems. your reef tank. Yeah. That's be just actually, as successful as everybody else. That's actually the mission, and, and I'm sure that when uh, Tony Hawk is watching that, he's watching all the kids that love skateboarding and how much more accessible it is when you don't have to eat coping every day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I think about that all the time. Yeah. So uh, confident that there is a bio in a bottle, not confident which one's best. There's These next two are, uh, uh, I can see, are part of the reason why it's so hard to uh, you know fo follow along with this bacterial conversation. Um, first one being what matters most is that many bacteria need to be dosed, uh, I'm talking on regular, regular basis, dosed, because they're freshwater bacteria. They uh, do not naturally replicate, replicate in, in salt water, and the only way to keep their populations up is to continually dose them. So that's the question is like, well, if there's food in here and there's bacteria, why do I keep having to dose they it? grow? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's because it's a freshwater bacteria that doesn't replicate in seawater. Yeah. The is what answer. It is. <laughs> so uh, you know, does that make it part of a natural biome in some cases? Uh, no. Uh, does it mean that it's a solution to your problem mm -hmm. that you couldn't beat uh, or have difficulty beating otherwise? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and That'd so I'll give you a good example actually of the uh, I before uh, vibrant, I had never seen a solution to eradicate bubble algae from a tank. Mm. And then, like, if you had bubble algae, it was, you're going to have it forever. You could maybe get some organisms that like to eat it, and it'll keep it at bay a little bit. Animals, maybe they work, yeah. maybe they don't. Sometimes. Uh, but now, with the advent of uh, Vibrant, it, dude, you dose that stuff for, you know, a couple of weeks and, or a month, and all mm. of a sudden, it all turns silver and just goes away. <laughs> That's well, uh, you know, uh, does that mean it's natural biome in the tank? No. no. Does it mean that uh, uh, bacteria in the bottle might just be the next frontier? Certainly is for that. Yeah. Solve that mega mega problem in an, in its entirety. <laughs> it's super easy too. All right. And anybody that I know in this industry that has been doing this for 20, 30, 40 years, like and they've seen bubble algae and they've never seen a real hardcore solution that works all the time. Mm. Like, wow, I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Uh, second one, uh, same thing. Uh, many bacterial products or bacteria need to be dosed again because they uh, are just outcompeted by something else. Uh, mm -hmm. Eventually, their population will get overran by something else. And so, to keep the population up, you have to keep adding more. That one, you know, is interesting because it's like it's dosing the zeo back and stuff like that to those tanks, and mm -hmm. like, yeah, they're just like, hey, dude, these the population of this stuff doesn't maintain high enough for the purpose <laughs> and the way that we use it naturally. We have to dose it, and like, huh? I mean, I don't know. I guess I just like I'm not a, a marine biologist. I'm not a microbiologist, yeah. uh, and it it. It doesn't really 100% pass the sniff test to me, but I also watch the people that dose those things, and often they have some of the most spectacular tanks there are. So uh, the net result, you know, like the Zeovit tanks that are dosing that stuff, yeah. the Zeobac, uh, 
awesome. Undeniable so results. I, whatever they're doing, man, is producing what I want. <laughs> no. All right, so uh, what matters most? Some of these things, we got a bunch of solutions that you might not be, su you'd be surprised. So yeah. some of these bacteria are solutions to algae. Mm -hmm. So I think of uh, the number one here being uh, the vibrant, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. that gets rid of chrysophytes and hair algae and uh, uh, get, tested. Uh, bubble algae, yeah. bryopsis, uh, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I've te we've tested that one a lot. Uh, boom, <clears throat> gone. Uh, in fact, uh, it may prevent it from even getting there to begin with. Uh, some of them are solutions. Some of these bacteria things are solutions to uh, slimes like cyanos. Yeah, the KZ one is a bacterial solution. Mm -hmm. uh, the Kimmy Cleans of the Worlds and stuff like that's an antibiotic. I don't know for sure what's in there. People th yeah. theorize it's antibiotic. Some people theorize it's like some kind of carbon uh, oh. dosing thing. And, uh, I don't really know what's in Chemi Clean or Red Slime Solutions or all those things. The KZ one is for sure a bacterial supplement. Yeah, and so that's why a lot and of it, people and like it's that one, one of those ones that you continually dose too. Yeah, mm -hmm. It's like you can use it to solve a problem, but you can keep a problem at bay by continually dosing it. Yeah, so if you go read the people's reviews on the chem or the Cyano Clean from KZ, this speaks to the person. There's a person that wants an instantaneous solution, uh, just kill it. Uh, and then there's people who want a more natural solution mm -hmm. that kind of gradually happens over time and you outcompete the cyano with other things that are beneficial in the tank. Uh, CyanoClean fits the second person. Yep. Uh, for sure. <clears throat> uh, also, there's some solutions to detritus. Dr. Tim's Waste Away was uh, it's this, yeah, I don't know, if, not heterotrophic. Uh, can't really tell. I can't sure. forget the, the differences uh, between. But this, uh, there's bacteria that actually go out there and uh, seek out like detritus and organic materials that are just kind of you know sitting there decaying, and uh, chew them up, eat them up, get rid of them, use them uh, as fuel source for themselves. So this is an example. I, I don't know for sure if waste away is this, but I believe it probably is. There's a lot of a freshwater type bacteria that are really aggressive about organic waste and breaking them down mm -hmm. super rapidly, even further than they were already broken down. So other filtration can use it. It's heavily mm -hmm. used in wastewater control. Yeah, for I, was gonna say, I was just going to, I was just thinking that in the back of my head, like this is something embraced by the human population for wastewater control. They're super commonly used. I yeah. mean, like probably every application of wastewater control in every municipality is using bacteria, bacteria in Sam fashion yeah. for this purpose. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> yeah, uh, and so I don't know exactly the strains that he's using here, but yeah. he's like the grandfather of bacteria. You know, he created Biospira in the beginning. <laughs> like his name's on the patent. He's the bacteria guy. There's a good magnet talk from 2019 from Dr. Tim that we have on our channel that's, probably, that's worth uh, watching. It's all about harnessing bacteria. For sure, dude. Uh, so uh, some solutions are are, some bacteria solutions are great for detritus. Some solutions are also great solutions for dinos. Uh, and so I think Dr. Tim has a like a little graph or something somewhere that shows what all the bacteria are used for. So you can go check that out. One of them's for dinos. I forget which one it is. Huh. But one of the really common ones is the Microbacter 7 from uh, 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 Brightwell. Brightwell yeah. So people will use the Microbacter 7, which is seven strains of bacteria, uh, to actually prevent dinos or part of the solution of outcompeting them in the end and getting some uh, healthy micro, or micro or, uh, bacterial load or biome into yeah. the tank. All frontiers worth testing. Uh, some solutions to the new tank uglies, meaning the ugly phase of the tank or uh, also prolonged uglies, like uh, what happens uh, over the tank over every week or two. Mm -hmm. uh, and so actually Jeff over at Vibrant uh, said that's what this product was originally designed for, is his uh, maintenance company is the tanks that uh, he maintenanced uh, every, uh, I think it was every other week or whatever, looked awesome. The ones that he had to maintain uh, every month looked like crap. Uh, it might have been every week or other week, I forget. But I, in any case, uh, the ones that there was there for uh, frequently look great. So we started using the Vibrant from a friend of his that developed a university and yeah. look, Lo and behold, man, the tanks look awesome all the time. <laughs> In fact, if you start the tank with it to begin with, you'll never ever see those things. I we're gonna that is gonna be part of the next uh, uh, biome in a bottle, and I, yeah. I don't know if that counts as biome. But in the end, if you don't have the new tank uglies and everything thrives in it, 
Does it matter? You've had it better than the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, if it's we funny. Could solve that if we could solve that. Uh, this is funny, actually. I, my my uh, business partner Andrew here, he, you know, is a like, you know, diehard barbecue, right? It's like, you know, smokes everything on the little Weber or whatever, and then like I'm telling him I'm using my pellet grill and whatever, and he's like, yeah, yeah it's cheating, man. But I gotta tell you, at the same time, you can't taste effort. <laughs> uh, and so if vibrant just solves it, you can't taste effort, man. So bioperfect, who cares if it looks awesome? I don't awesome. want to taste effort. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. So another one is nutrient control. This is the bacteria one that everybody embraces almost wholeheartedly. Mm. Like, this is just so obvious it works, right? Yeah, the KZ Zeobac, the you harnessing back to that whole uh, Zeovit you know, uh, process or the whole Zeovit method is backed on uh, harnessing bacteria for uh, this purpose, for nutrient control. There's some carbon dosing based in there, also backed with tons of uh, food input in or nutrition input in. But uh, this is one of those. This is one of those systems where you can absolutely point to hundreds and if not thousands of users that are doing this uh, at a high level to producing some really awesome tanks and saying, yeah, bacteria helped with that. I would say that <coughs> Zeovit is probably the first carbon dosing method that had worked at scale mm. and continues to be the reigning king. Mm. It is the threshold at which every other additive company out there in carbon dosing would strive to achieve. And there was a, uh, you know, probably a sense of, uh, well, you won't tell me what's in those blue bottles. So I, I won't believe you that it works, but you know, the evidence is, is there in all mm -hmm. of the Zeovit form and all the tanks that are applying it. This 160 tank, uh, when we were running on it, uh, proof in the pudding. Yeah, and so like even you can watch it, it's kind of <laughs> interesting. Like from the beginning, they were telling you, you know, A, you got to strip all the nutrients out using the bacteria, and then we add nutrition back in, so there's no natural sources of nitrogen and phosphorus via these foods. They've been doing that forever. And then all of a sudden, carbon dosing got popular in reefing, and everybody was using vodka, vodka and then, you know, vinegar. sugar and vinegar and uh, who knows, Bio pellets. Man, peanuts, you know, <laughs> whatever, uh, rice and all kinds of yeah. stuff. And yeah, sure, it stripped out all the nutrients, but like you missed the point about adding nutrition back in mm -hmm. as the sources of nitrogen and phosphorus with yeah. the, in, a, in a tank that isn't polluted with those things. Yeah. Uh, all right, so you put it all back together. So yeah, there's lots of them now, uh, you know, uh, NO3, PO4X, and the Reef Energy A and B and stuff from Red Sea that yeah. you know fits yeah. that bill. Uh, I would say that uh, Tropic Marin is now like a up and comer. Uh, if you go look at all of the Lou's, bacteria solutions, yeah. yeah, Lou has a I mean, totally different. Approach. There's some there's some uh, speeches uh, by Lou uh, from Tropic Marin about the carbon dosing that are just worth you know watching and un help you understand what you're doing with carbon dosing. There's definitely more intelligent manners <coughs> to, to do it. So I would go check out Lou's videos as well uh, on YouTube. Dr. Tim for sure too. Uh, and Dr. Tim, but. Like if I was going to do carbon dosing and I wanted to know that I had the highest percentage path to success, I would emulate KZ. those that came before me for decades. I don't think anybody has beat KZ at this point or even really close on the, the bacteria, leveraging bacteria for a cleaner tank. That's the method. Yes. All right, so hard lessons. About bacteria. Uh, bacteria for a cleaner reef tank. First one is uh, you're hearing this uh, over and over again. Resistance to these concepts is what's holding us back. Let's get past that. Yep. Another hard lesson is, uh, Jeff gave us this one that was really good. What took you six months to have uh, cause in your tank should take you months to get out as well. Yeah, uh, a solution that uh, solves your problem uh, instantaneously, but it took you six months to get there, not, likely the best solution. If it took, if the result is your tank is filled with all kinds of gunk and slimes and algaes and it took a year of terrible maintenance to get there, uh, if you're hoping you're going to go use a product that is going to turn that around in a week, not only will it not likely do that uh, and you'll be disappointed, Maybe but worse. also even if it did, it would probably be really bad. Yeah. Uh, you don't want all that stuff dying all at once. You yeah. don't want all that. Despite what you think you want, you do not want that. <laughs> uh, and so that was really helpful for me. Is like yeah, this was an eye opener. Uh, that was an eye opener thought that he shared with us. Is that yes, yeah, of course, six months to get there. Why not six months to come back? 
So things like uh, the vibrant, uh, it just be like what you'll see is like, oh, I, I put it in there and it seems to start working. Well, wouldn't more be better then, mm, right? Nope. Like, I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a total. I total love problem. hammers. Like I, that is speaks to me. I want some more is better. I like to do it faster, right? <laughs> if, if two tablespoons is good, then sixteen must be great. Uh, so the problem is that mm. isn't true. And so if you see it is working, don't try to speed it up. Just ride that wave, man, because in you know a matter of weeks, it'll happen slowly, eliminate the problem. So it took you six months to get there. Let it take a couple months yeah. uh, to get out. And just be happy with the progress that you're getting and that you're doing it the right way uh, instead of, well, if, I, if it works now, what if I dumped in tons of it? Because tons of it might not have the desired effect. Yeah, not made a for that A whole purpose. variety of different <clears throat> things. So... Uh, another hard lesson we learned uh, is that carbon dosing, the dose, is very hard to nail down. Uh, and how would you know if you overdose? I did some carbon dosing, uh, quote unquote, blind carbon dosing back in the day when I was like, oh, well, I, I've got vinegar around the house. I'll add it to my Kalkwasser ATO. Not only is it going to increase the saturation of my Kalkwasser, but I'm going to get this uh, nitrate uh, type lowering benefit here because I'm carbon dosing. Uh, the problem is, is I, how do you know how much to even use or dose? Or if you're going to put uh, vodka or vinegar, or uh, if you were going to put you know, like bio pellets on uh, on your tank, how much do you use, and when do you change it, and uh, how? Do, what's the measurement of success? That's why I think carbon dosing shouldn't be considered a tool. It should can be considered a method that has everything wrapped around it. Yeah. Right? Is because. It is a little bit of a mystery box. You know, it works fantastic, but like there's a lot of moving levers into it. And like the reality is, is uh, if I if it took 10 milliliters of this stuff to be able to uh, uh, control the nutrient levels in my tank, what would happen if I dosed 20? No. Well, the, there's nothing there to use it anymore. Yeah. I used it all up to get it down to nitro, the nitrogen and phosphorus down to zero. So I'm essentially just adding an extra 10 milliliters of organic, organic carbon, carbon to the tank yeah. mm -hmm. every day for the next 365 days. What does like, that do when it builds what's up? What's the net effect of tons of organic carbon building up in the tank? And does it build up yeah. that way? I don't yeah. know. Yeah, there's a relationship between nitrogen, phosphorus, organic carbon. There's a natural balance in the ocean. Uh, really hard to, like, a adjust each one of those levers in our little tanks. Yeah, and then you think about uh, the ratio of zero nitrate, zero phosphate, and... Tons uh, of organic um, carbon? Over organic carbon, probably gonna cause a problem. I have no idea, yeah. yeah. It's worth testing. Okay, so that's why, like, when you work with things like KZ, uh, uh, you end up with a whole community that has been testing this for the last 30 years, and they've come up with starting doses very, that uh, very. you work your way up. And, and you start doing it from the beginning. I'm not, this isn't some knee jerk thing I did where like all of a sudden my nitrate and phosphate are off the hook. So rather than do water changes or anything, I'll just like dump vinegar in the tank to get it down. Yeah. Uh, well, man, I don't think that you're gonna get the desired result out of that the way that you want. At least, I don't think you're gonna find high percentage repeatable results that way. And there'll be some people that it works out for, for whatever reason, maybe they're maintaining their tanks mm. different than other people. But a lot of people that will not go well. <laughs> uh, it's a big. Your tank is a big giant ship. It's hard to uh, steer uh, ninety degrees quickly. Hey, in that spirit, also uh, bio. Oh, I'm gonna put one last thing on that piece then. So you never know if you overdose. So if you happen to do it that other way, which is like I have really high nitrate and phosphate, and I want to start carbon dosing to get it down, I still suggest you just water change it out and then start from that point, start a new system. But yep. let's say you just like don't want to listen to me on that front <laughs> and you don't want to do the water changes. So then make sure that you know that if it took 10 milliliters a day to get it down. Well, it's probably going to take a fraction of that to every maintain. day to, to maintain it. So yeah. once you get to zero, you might actually I only need one tenth of what you did Ooh. to get there. Still, water change it out, then start is a better path. Uh, this next one's for you. Oh, bio pellets, uh, hard lesson. Uh, this isn't a hard lesson. I, I don't know. There's, bio pellets are just not for me. They're not for me either. And it was one of those things where when I was uh, researching and first getting into the hobby, I was like, man, there's carbon, there's GFO, there's bio pellets, there's you know all these uh, skimmers, there's uh, filter socks, there's all these things that I have to use because uh, I wasn't told you know which ones are actually beneficial, which ones do I need. Uh, I never did use bio pellets, but uh, I, I also don't think I would. Uh, here's the thing. I know they exist. 
I just don't know that many people that have epic bio pellet tanks. That's so I don't look to my mentors, and I don't have any there's mentors. A few, there's probably a few out there, but like yeah. not some that you can point at and go, oh, you know all those bio, those bio pellet tanks? It's just in my circle. I know they exist. Yeah. I know there's really awesome bio pellet tanks out there. Just yeah. in my circle, I haven't seen them, so uh, I, like, I just don't emulate them. Yeah. I also have a little, like I understand the carbon dose of uh, one milliliter a day of adding it. Having this like kind of weird infinite source of, uh, not infinite, but a lot of uh, organic in these pellets just tumbling around in there. No way to Kind really of hoping that it. it's like self-controlled. Yeah. Uh, it just doesn't speak to me. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I, I get that people use it effectively. It just doesn't speak to me. There's just uh, other options out there that have. I trust something that tells me, like, like the KZ, like the No Pox, like uh, Tropic Mare and stuff. I would just rather trust, uh, put my trust in somebody that tells me or something that tells me exactly how much to dose and when and what frequency, and then and then take it from there. Like, I don't want this unknown. Uh, throw a couple cups of vodka in your uh, ATO, or throw some bio pellets in the reactor and hope it works. Mm, yeah, I would yeah. rather some finite direction. It's kind of like one of those things, it's like that recipe thing. It's like, yeah, we made some cookies. It called <coughs> for a teaspoon of uh, baking soda, and we just put it in three to see what happens. See what happens. <laughs> no, nothing good happens. Not a good... Uh, you know, the one, w the one place that I... <coughs> I don't know if I would do this or not, but the one place I might think about bio pellets would be a fish-only tank. Mm, okay. You know, like, I might try it there just to see if I could maintain low nitrates and phosphates in a system Just that I it's intentionally designed to be lower maintenance. Yeah, and uh, and when the, the only goal of the tank is just uh, fat, happy, healthy fish, uh, you know, I'm uh, less concerned. I don't know. It'd be something. It'd be interesting. I'm, I'm just saying that there's one area where I'd be open-minded. I thinking, still don't know if I'd do it. Because you're thinking about putting up a fowler, though, aren't you? I'm almost certainly going to do it. If we, don't, if we do it here, we don't do it here, we're gonna, I'm going to do it in my house. I'm, yeah. I want... I want that for myself. Yeah. You know, uh, you know what it is, actually, I was just thinking about this yesterday, is uh, the first thing I'm drawn to at every uh, uh, display in a zoo, uh, or even when I'm snorkeling, is eels. Mm. I don't know what it is, I just like eels, yeah. right? Uh, they're just kind of creepy looking, they move just kind of cool, yeah, and I really just... Those ribbon eels? Oh my god, yeah. they're gorgeous. I just, I just like them, man. I yeah. just don't know how to say it any other way. Like man. Snake, it's, underwater snakes. <laughs> when I find one snorkeling, it's the thing that I'm, like, I could sit there for an hour and watch. The rest of it, I'll just kind of float over. <laughs> like uh, but, yeah, so, like, I want <laughs> to, uh, to uh, set up, if I don't set it at home, I'll probably set up here, you guys will follow the journey, but, <laughs> yeah, maybe... Maybe bio pellets? pellets? Uh, I don't know. I guess we'll see. Yeah. Uh, uh, hard lesson also, carbon dosing. It's still a new frontier. It's still a new frontier. Yeah. Uh, by st still not a new frontier, I mean this has not been nailed down. Like, uh, in fact, the only company I can think of that I feel like really nailed it down is KZ. The rest of them, really loose guidance mm. uh, into how it all comes together. Mm. Uh, I would say that, you know, commercially that, like Red Sea is on the play on the map, and then I think that Tropic Marin will be the up and comer. Mm, yep. Uh, uh, another hard lesson: emulating success is the best path, and I think uh, that's just something that you hear throughout all of these series and all these videos that we do. Is that just picking somebody to emulate who's having awesome success or great success? That's probably your best path to success. If you want to do uh, any one of these, carbon dosing, uh, using bacteria to fight algae, cyano, detritus, dinos, the new tank uglies, uh, the best thing you can do is uh, find somebody that has done that before you and emulate their exact path yep. because you may produce the exact same results. Right. Uh, without that, who knows? Yeah, <laughs> otherwise you're making your own cookie recipe. Yes. All right, so what's next? All right, up next we are talking about episode 27 of the 52 Weeks of Reefing. This one called Refugiums, Utilizing Algae for a Thriving Reef Tank. This was just before we started the whole Refugium conversation and Refugium uh, investigates, or right around the same time. Actually, no, because the 160 was already up and running with feeling before we got to here. So Barely, yep. I, I bet you if you go back and watch the 2015 Refugium episode, completely different than what we're about to talk about here. It's not even the same category. As Evolutionary as leap in refugiums. Uh, uh, in 20 mm -hmm. uh, and back in 20 or 2015, you were a hard man to convert over to refugiums. 
Uh, well, I believed, yeah. man, that it was removing something. It was part of my first tank. Uh, we got natural sunlight, though. So, like, my first tank uh, that had a hang-on refugium with those CPR mm -hmm. guys, yep. uh, I had a light on it, but really what happened is it, it got natural sunlight through the glass there, and it just thrived. And there was no question. It was... I was pulling out Cato like at nobody's business, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, I, and it also produced, you know, an enormous amount of pods for the tank. I, I was a, a Refugium fan, but behind the scenes, everybody's like, yeah, Refugiums don't really work. You know, they, no. don't, they don't really pull out anything. It's just a feel-good maneuver. I remember having that conversation yeah. with you. Like, yeah, what does it, uh, add, what does it take? Like, uh, 10, 15 percent less maintenance from with the other filters, mm -hmm. uh, and and probably so because of the way that we were actually lighting them. Which, were once you figured that so that out, pff, sky's the the limit. Yeah, so we'll get into that. But basically, we found out if you light them proper, then they are maybe work too well. Is actually the problem. Yeah. Uh, but you know what? That hits on the fact that why my first experience is it worked so well because it was getting direct sunlight. Yeah. That's why it works so well. I wasn't relying on a $5 crappy bulb on the top of it. <laughs> uh, but it, like later on, we'd figure that out with artificial light as well. Uh, core belief about refugiums. Core belief, refugiums are the easiest way to solve nutrient issues. Done. I'm not even going to repeat it. I'm going to repeat it. <laughs> you have to uh, repeat uh, like, it. Refugiums are simply the easiest way to solve nutrient systems. Uh, uh, issues on your tank, it's just a bucket bowl of algae in your sump and light. it soaks it all up you throw a light on it you grab something you throw it in the trash done and like it doesn't break yeah. it uh, like that this is perpetual the machine. end point <laughs> uh, uh this is how you, like your turd uh or your uh your filter socks and felt pull out the turds the protein skimmer pulls out the long chain molecules or whatever the refugium the refugium whatever everything that it miss nitrogen and phosphorus now if you got a well working phosph or a few refugium nitrogen and phosphorus or nitrate phosphorus will never be your problem uh at least not high yep so yep. uh core belief right there so what matters most uh first thing that matters most when it comes to refugiums is that performance of your refugium is 90% tied to the light, uh, the, um, to the light. Oh, I see, I'm, yep. I had a couple of them up here. 90% of your uh, refugium success is because of the light and the light choice that you choose. I mean, we investigated this and we used the compact CFL, you know, the CFL bulb in the, in the little metal uh, kind of made for warming chickens in your chicken coop at home for over the top of the refugium clip-on uh, versus LED, uh, little round LEDs that are like blue and white LEDs versus uh, red LEDs versus just this hoarder culture specific uh, Kessel, three, or Kessel uh, Fuge light and quickly found that the blurple color it grows and the intensity grows algae uh, immensely. 90% of success. Okay, this is already well known in every <laughs> uh, like horticulture world known to man is growing plants. No, no surprise here. If you Water didn't change that. Yeah, if you increase the amount of photosynthetic energy being uh, the right spectrum and 10 times more, well, it'll grow 10 times faster and it will suck up 10 times as much nitrogen and phosphorus. Those are all loose numbers, but you get the point. Yeah. Uh, and worse yet, what we were trying to do beforehand uh, is that uh, we got multiple thousand dollars worth of, su uh, of lights in the front trying to replicate the sun. Uh, that's where the algae is growing, and we're going to try to prevent the algae from growing in the back with a $5 <laughs> compact fluorescent and your little clip on thing <laughs> at five bucks. That was never going to work. That was, that was yep. never going to achieve the goal that we wanted. Yep. Uh, and once we abandoned that and said, you know what, Let's if we put the power of the sun in the back, it will outcompete the power of the sun in the front. And, and it did. And boom. <laughs> we even <laughs> found in our experiments that uh, in many cases, we could change the trajectory of brand new tanks. You know, if you had an effective uh, uh, refugium started up fairly quickly, Instead of letting nitrogen and phosphorus feed the algae in the front of the tank, uh, it would feed the algae in the back of the tank, and you wouldn't see any algae in the front of the tank. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, I don't know. Totally changed it. Performance, 90% related to light. There's other flow and other pieces, yeah. man, but most of it will. If you're not having uh, luck with it, it will probably be the light. It's probably tied to your light. Yeah. You can go too strong, by the way. Yes, you uh, can. But and burn it. It, uh, the problem ah. before was too light. But that leads to the next most, um, what matters most is it may be too strong. So the best refugium lighting options will be adjustable. 
this was a uh, kind of a roadblock that we ran into early on where you kind of you had an on and off and maybe bloom and grow. Uh, since then, uh, we can adjust the light. You can adjust the intensity up and down. If it's pulling out too much, adjust the intensity down. If it's not pulling out enough, adjust the intensity up. That's it. If you're burning it and bleaching it, adjust Turn it, it down. down, right? Wide angle, better <coughs> than narrow focused angle. Yes. Uh, so yeah, best options will definitely be adjustable. Uh, and it doesn't have to be huge to work. It used mm -hmm. to be that refugium had to be like 20% the size of the, uh, the tank big or some crazy thing. light and whatnot. Yeah, yeah that was because you had a big giant giant thing that was trying to be lit by a five dollar bulb uh, of course uh, it, but if I get ten times the photosynthesis out of this the thing can be literally ten times as small that little, uh, that little tiny it was the age called the h150 initially it was uh, the first uh, kind of that horticulture light that we put on the 160 uh, and it's you know your standard uh, uh, 360 but not before the X uh, so like a 150 degree beam angle and you have that thing uh, about eight inches or six or eight inches above the refugium, it would it was growing not only the top of the algae in the 160 in a section that's like 16 inches by like 12 inches by like f 13 or 14 inches deep, but when you turn the entire mass of Cato over, the bottom side was also green. Yeah, I mean, it's the <coughs> Cato is capable of, you know, spreading the nutrient yeah. throughout the whole thing, yeah. you know? Uh, so, yeah, uh, I, I would say that uh, another here lesson is a scrubber. Uh, what matters most is a scrubber is essentially a refugium in a compact box. It's like a hair algae refugium, but uh, instead of being uh, mm. in a big area in your sump, a uh, 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 algae scrubber is just like a little box refugium. And instead of grabbing some and throwing the trash, scraper you use off. a little scraper and scrapes them into the trash. Probably grows faster than Cato also, right? The hair algae cells. It's a less complex organism, yeah. so the hair algae will grow faster, which means you can probably use, that's why, like it said, you don't need a yeah. big giant one. Yeah. You can get smaller and smaller and smaller. And some of the best ones are actually rated by the amount of cubes of food, which mm -hmm. is cool. Yeah. Right, so it, 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 like, it doesn't tell you this is for a 100 gallon tank, it's for, how many cubes of food do you put in the tank? That's how we size it because this thing is capable of using that much nitrogen and phosphorus a day. Yeah. yeah. Scrubbers. I love them. Yep. I'm a big fan. Uh, we'll hit the one above there. Uh, clean Cato is oh. important. Uh, that is what one of the things that matters most. Clean Cato is important. And actually, uh, if I'm not mistaken, isn't that where our Aptasia problem came from in here? Mm -hmm. Is because we you grabbed a, we grabbed a chunk of Cato from one of the office tanks around here that had Aptasia in it. Wasn't you know really uh, concerned or thinking about all right, well whatever's in that tank is going to transfer over to this one. Next thing you know, our refugium's thriving, and so are the Aptasia. Yep. Uh, I would just say uh, a refugium tends to be a haven for photosynthetic organism or pests. So uh, yeah. if uh, you got pests, it's probably in there. So like algae barns will sell clean Cato, but we haven't figured it out exactly, but there's a couple of ways I think you could do this. You could attempt to take dirty Cato. Uh, some people have soaked it in fresh water overnight. Some mm. people have put it in the refrigerator in fresh water overnight. Like sometimes it will just totally deteriorate when you do those types of things. Probably depends on like the strain or health of the Cato. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I think that like most things won't survive like uh, like Aptasia and stuff won't survive being in fresh water overnight yeah you know mm. uh, and so there's a lot of things that won't make it through that process I would suggest if you have to use dirty Cato or Cato from somebody else's tank or Cato from a fish store that clearly has stuff in it uh, I would consider even if you killed it doing some extensive things to try to get rid of it and like Coral dip and stuff won't do that. Yeah, uh, coral dip doesn't kill Aptasia. Even fr uh, I, I've put a bunch of uh, Cato in a freshwater like little tank before, and like two days later came back to it, uh, or it was a day or two days later, and uh, it actually turned all of the Cato into mush. So I did it overnight, and <laughs> I was able to do it fine, and yeah. it came back. It like a week, but it, it'll stay alive, mm -hmm. right? 
So the Kato will survive most things that the pest won't. So push it mm. to the limits and be okay yeah. if you kill it. Kato will also survive in, uh, what was it, uh, Ron in, in the lab and uh, Jason were just, they just put some water in a bag with some Kato and just let it sit on the, uh, on the shelf or on their desk for, for a long time. And that, that actually just kept living and living and living and living and maybe you maybe you eventually starve out some of those pests. My, perf my, my fear would be that Aptasia would survive Still that. survive. Right, yeah. so would it survive uh, 40 degrees though? Yeah. I don't think so, uh, not very long. Yeah. Will the Kato survive 40 degrees? Probably a lot longer than the Aptasia does. Mm. Uh, there's gonna be some experiments here, so you know, if this, I'm going to challenge the community, actually, because the result in this case is going to come from a lot of different... Maybe we could do it here, actually, too. Mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, this would be a great investigate, actually. To, mm -hmm. We'll never know 100% whether or not it was pest-free, but we can definitely test whether or not it survives these really difficult uh, endeavors. The quarantines and medications yeah. and temperatures and dips and whatnot, yeah. And things that would kill the types of pests that we would want to kill, will the Kato survive that? Yeah. And can we, can you can we take it? dirty Kato and turn it clean? Mm -hmm. 2026, we'll add that to uh, this update, <laughs> uh, for sure. A uh, good thing about algae scrubbers is that uh, it, you, oh, yes. you don't need to source anything. It will just start automatically growing. So whatever's in your tank is already in your tank. Uh, put an algae scrubber on it and it's, you didn't add anything. That's one of the biggest advantages to an algae scrubber is you don't have to source a clean source of algae. Just turn on the light. Turn the light on, it'll create its own. Eventually it'll get there, yeah. 100%. Uh, okay, so uh, algae reactor also works for, algae reactor is essentially just a refugium in a tube instead yep. of in a tank. Yep. And it will absolutely work uh, for people that are space constrained, uh, but it does have some challenges, one of which I'll share in just a minute. Yep. Uh, another thing that matters the most is it does your Kato doesn't have to rotate, uh, but it's probably better if it did, in the uh, exposing all the sides of the Kato mass or the Kato ball to the to the light. Uh, it doesn't have to, and um, 160, like uh, I said, when you turn the whole mass over, uh, it was green on the other side, and exporting all of those nutrients and everything throughout the whole mass. Uh, but probably best if you can find a way to roll this thing over. Yeah. So the best way I think I could say this is I probably wouldn't bother trying to figure out how to make how it to get it to tumble. Or I've roll. never made it bothered in the past. Uh, like we, it just grows into a mat, and it's just fine. Yeah, and that's what I needed it to do. I think every once in a while, somebody would actually flip the whole mass over, and that was probably very few and far between. One exception here. If somebody made, uh, some manufacturers, somebody made a uh, rotisserie. <laughs> Kato rotisserie? Yeah, if somebody made a Kato rotisserie, meaning that there's a little bar. bar in the middle and it just slowly spins, you know, maybe once little an hooks hour or, or once off a the day bar. or yeah. whatever. It is almost certainly going to be better for the Kato. There'll be better flow through it. Uh, you'll expose all of it to light. Uh, it'll probably be better. I, in the spirit of the hunt for best, I will tell you the mat is the spirit of the hunt for good enough. And in this case, good enough, meaning it might out, it, it might works work too better well. than you need it. So <laughs> I don't know. The one piece though, is if you made the rotisserie uh, and it just span, uh, spun there, probably better for, uh, it would probably grow faster, but also, it would allow you to clean out the mm. sump area there better because yeah. like, Refugiums are notorious for becoming detritus traps Just as well. Huge piles of yucky gush underneath. Yeah. Yeah, and so I think that you might be able to maintain a cleaner tank if you had the rotisserie and the bottom was bare and you were able to clean it out. Hmm. Hard lessons learned when it comes to refugiums and use, utilizing algae. Uh, first one is a reactor will go uh, will grow other stuff if it's empty. Empty meaning like you know, I started with a little, you know, maybe bigger than a golf ball size and I threw it in my algae reactor and then said, okay, start growing full of algae or growing full of Kato. Uh, there's other stuff that'll eventually win out that battle of the growth. 
so I had that problem with the uh, arid Pax Bellum, right? The weird Which slime. Is, yeah, and I I brought home a ball. It's like a you know probably a you know melon or yeah. whatever, right? Uh, but the reactor is this big, <coughs> yeah. and I like kind of tried to spread it out as much as I could throughout the whole thing. Uh, but in the end, when we opened it up, it was just filled with all kinds of algaes and slimes yeah. and other photosynthetic organisms all over because. I was putting a tremendous amount of light into this thing. It's clear, it's got a white out, it's lights bouncing all over the place. Uh, and there was nothing in there to, to soak it up, so, or only in a portion of it. So it just didn't work. So yeah. I think if I were to try the LG reactor again, just fill, I'd have to find a way to fill the whole damn thing up with uh, LG. Otherwise, I. I I'd be afraid that I'm just going to create the same scenario. Again. Yeah, yeah. So it might be that I want to grow the grow the algae in a bucket or something first somehow and grow it out and then, then put fill it in. in your reactor. Hmm. It sounds like a big pain in the butt. That's uh, a big pain. But like, here's the deal, though. I, I also your didn't, space limited. I don't have a refugium yeah. on my sump, uh, and so mistake. Sh like shame on me for not prioritizing it. Sure, uh, I'll find another way to put a, re a remote one on there, but like. Uh, I yeah. thought I could do it this way. In the end, I'd actually, because I'm not space constrained, I would rather just put, you know, put potentially refugium. another refugium box next to the sump and solve the problem <laughs> that way. Uh, we also have the hard lesson learned of a fuge may work too well. Uh, case in point, right behind us, the 160. Got the fuge going, got that H1200, which is essentially or almost like uh, it's, uh, close to like four 360Xs, huge lights in one box. Uh, got that thing running, up and running, with that, turned, turned to 5% intensity, uh, and had it running seven days a week. Um, but you know what happened is, is you start testing nitrates and phosphates at the BRS-160, and we're, I mean, we're dosing some of the KZ bottles. We're dumping food down this tank's gullet. It's like way too much, purposely overfeeding. Still can't register nitrates and phosphates to the point so that we had to turn, it, uh, turn the refugium down to Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, and that's the only time it got lit. And then it kind of balanced out that nitrogen, uh, nitrate and phosphate problem. Yeah, so in some cases, you could probably just shorten the hours instead. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, do four hours a day. Uh, you know, it really depends on this part of the way that you could tune it. But yeah, you may find that your refugium actually, your problem used to be nitrate and phosphate, uh, now your problem is uh, there's no nitrogen and phosphorus in this tank, and I never thought about how I should add amino acids and particulate foods as sources of nitrogen and phosphorus to the corals. Mm. So your corals get pale, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but you don't have algaes and pests in the tank because uh, those <laughs> things are starved out, so great news there. But uh, yeah, uh, one of the hard lessons is a refugium sometimes, man, can like work better than you had hoped, uh, and it may cause a different type of mm. problem. Uh, I will also say a hard lesson is a refugium is a detritus net. Yeah. So that big blob of uh, web of uh, catomorpha and all the water that's going through it just collects all the detritus and becomes the tank's dumpster. Yeah, unless you, you put know? it after like filter socks or filter rollers or fleece or something like that, it's just going to capture it all right there. And when you the disturb ones. it, clouds of garbage oh, yeah. come out of it. Yeah, definitely so, have that. That is a, you may want to work around that one. I usually, when you're going to disturb it, turn the sump off for a little bit. Uh, and I'm not afraid to like take the whole thing out and like rinse it and suck all the garbage out of there periodically. Mm -hmm. But like, yeah, uh, there's no way around it. It will definitely benefit from an approach to uh, a particulate management, meaning felt or fleece. Yep. Uh, but yes, the try this net. <laughs> Uh, another hard lesson, uh, hard to start your refugium with a golf ball sized piece of Kato. I was like, even if I, so I, so I got myself the, uh, the horticulture specific light for my refugium, got a nice big old space, you know, 10 by 10 or what have you picked out for my fuge. And then I go and find a uh, little ball of uh, Kato about like a golf ball or even that's just slightly bigger. And, uh, and then say, all right, I uh, expect that thing to start taking over and growing out my fuge uh, from day one. And my experience was a lot of times that ended up just turning into dead Kato. You know, it just came to me. I think if, if I was going to do that and I was going to start from a golf ball, 
I would go get some kind of clear container, put it in the window, mm. and yeah. uh, let like the sun grow it out. I wouldn't bigger, bother trying to bigger, do it in the bigger. aquarium. Yeah. I might dose some like uh, organic, you know, fertilizer mm. or something to it, like you know, hydroponic type stuff. Mm. Just blended up fish usually, yeah. uh, and grow it out. Not in the sump or tank, but grow it out in a window or, or something like Until that. Until you get yourself a nice big mass to start with, throw it in, and you're off to the races. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. It saves your money, too, on buying a bunch of Kato. Yeah, well, that's one of those things, like we say, you should like cycle your tank, your rock first before you start. So like, if you're thinking about starting your tank right now, uh, well, I don't know. Get Maybe yourself buy a golf ball. ball a golf get yourself ball a golf ball size. Put it in a easier to glass make, in the window. Easier to make sure a golf ball size is uh, pest free versus, or you know, less pest versus a big giant blob of it. If yeah. you're not sourcing it from a clean source. I think clear pitcher and some light, <laughs> a little maybe an air stone or something, uh, or water, done. just to turn it around at a pump. I don't, you know, something really minimal, and just let the let it do its job before you add it in. Yep. I gotta try that. <laughs> I gotta, no. I'm gonna go get. I'm gonna go get some Kato. Put it in a cup in my window. See what happens. <laughs> uh, another hard lesson is uh, wait for detectable nutrients. This is that that piece we were just talking about. Uh, we started the ULMs uh, as a tank trials. There were, there were two tanks. Yeah, two tanks that we started with refugiums from day one. Uh, and I mean, we and we started with a mass of Cato, a big giant mass of Cato. Uh, but like, was it months down the road or you know, a few weeks down the road, the, ref the all of the Cato inside were just turning to mush and dying, and then everything died off, and it was just a yucky, nasty mess. But you know, you think about it in hindsight, there, what was it feeding on? Nothing. Yeah, uh, no nutrient. Well, hardly. But uh, maybe some of the ammonia of the cycling tank, uh, mm -hmm. but really nothing for it to thrive on. So. Get the nutrients there to begin with. Doesn't have to be a lot, but something. Then start it. Yep. Uh, also, uh, hard <laughs> lesson is uh, it is a photosynthetic organism that's pulling out things a little different uh, than some of the corals, meaning it's going to suck out some elements from the tank. Mm. You know, iron, manganese, uh, some stuff like that, molybdenum, all that kind of stuff. I think uh, you know, Brightwell makes this stuff called Cato Grow to yep. replace some of it. Yep. Uh, but uh, I think this might be best managed with a, a like considering that in the two part. And so, you know, as a, that two part is how you manage elements. And so instead of adding like more stuff, the Triton, Triton is core seven specifically designed around the fact that you're going to run a refugium, meaning that it's compensating for that with the iron, the magnesium, mm. the molybdenum, those types of things in there. Yeah. Uh, in fact, there are only two, two parts at this point that I would probably consider using. I would use the BRS2 part with uh, the A and K as the hybrid solution from uh, uh, Tropic, uh, Marin. Tropic Marin. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, this is just high purity, got trace elements now, like, I don't know, it's the best, win, 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 win. Yep. It's, it's affordable, it's the best available grade of product and has the trace elements in it, I would not tell you this. <laughs> Uh, and then, uh, but the only other one that I would ever consider using is the Triton, Triton. you know, because the Triton, I use refugiums exclusively. I like, I like all my tanks have refugiums. I screwed up on one of them. I'm going to find a way to get it on there anyway. Uh, and I regret it now because it, I've, I see nitrate and phosphate problems just with minimal feeding even into his giant tank. Mm. Uh, and like we're ending up doing water change. Like I gotta find only in a refugium. There's another problem with that. <laughs> uh, but. In that spirit, Triton, because it's designed around uh, phosphate and uh, nitrate, uh, or uh, it's designed around nutrient reduction through refugi refugiums and the, uh, the elements you'll uptake with that, it's designed for me, yeah. is what it basically yeah. is. Yeah. And then actually even more so, because I actually was thinking about this uh, yesterday too, is we have a pH problem in this whole building. Oh yeah. Because we have just 100 people breathing in here. Yes. Okay. The the uh, Triton not only uh, I'm gonna give it like a look a three piece pitch for the Triton okay because I, it was going through my own mind for my own tank and so uh, one it's designed for a refugium two uh, it has the highest pH impact uh, of all of them so of all the two parts it will increase the pH yeah. the most uh, yeah, highly uh, concentrated alkalinity yeah I think it might use a different form of it mm. might use a hydroxide yeah. instead mm. but. Uh, 
it it it'll have the biggest impact uh, uh, on, on the pH. Also, you, it's more concentrated, so I don't have to change out the solutions as often. <laughs> yeah. And on a big tank that has a lot of uptake, uh, I, you know that could be really valuable. So change it out for you less often. Uh, design for my tank and uh, helps my pH when pH is my problem here. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's, tem it's tempting to use that one. Uh, another hard lesson, and uh, I personally, I would set it up this way. This is, we get the question a lot when you're talking about, oh, hey, I'm going to implement a fuge. Do I put it before my skimmer or do I put it after my skimmer? Uh, fleece skimmer fuge is likely the best. Personally, I've cleaned enough Kato out of the skimmer intake uh, and the pump of this 160 because it's after the fuge a and a lot of it go some of it goes over the baffles and then into there we actually have a piece of aqua mesh uh, after the baffle to catch some of that stuff uh, but still there's some Kato it just their pieces break it happens um, in which case I, uh, I just put my skimmer in front of my fuge and not have that problem so that said, I would if your if your sump isn't designed for that, I wouldn't spend right. a lot of time uh, worrying right. about it. But like uh, people ask all the time, what's the ideal? And if if I had to tell you the ideal, I would agree. It would be capture all the big particles so that the Kato doesn't yep. become a, a detritus trap. It will still happen to some degree, but much less. So yep. felt and filter socks or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and then your skimmer, which will pull out Organics. even more of that stuff, and the skimmer will get filled with a uh, Kato. Uh, and then the Kato, which yeah. in, means now the return pump might get that in there. Why the aqua mesh and stuff in yeah. the world is probably best. Yeah. I mean, you're always going to trade something for something, but if I had to pick a perfect world, that would probably be it for me. Just the main piece is just I want to get as little detritus and crap in there as possible because it is It'll just, just a hold net. on to it, yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. Uh, so that's probably less, so, or, or best. So what's next? Next, we are on episode 28. This one called Ozone and Reef Tanks. Crystal clear tanks, but at a cost. Was the, That was the 52 Weeks original title for that episode. Uh, here's where we're thinking about uh, Ozone at today. Uh, you know, this is a space that we haven't really mm -mm. explored in detail. And it's a... It, it, it's, it's been a, a long-standing tool in the hobby. I've uh, people use it for a long time. Yeah, uh, like when I went and visited Live Aquaria, they were using it on their skimmers and mm. those big, huge RKK2 things yeah. and stuff. Uh, a core belief here, though, is ozone is like running carbon 24/7, uh, but the best way of doing it still isn't clear. Yeah. So I'll repeat it again. <laughs> uh, the Ozone is like running carbon 24-7. It doesn't need to be changed, but the best way of using it still isn't clear. Uh, there's some safety issues with it, both for the tank, maybe for your house, uh, but uh, it's not as well understood, yeah. but man, there's some attractive pieces to it. Yeah, this is a topic that I have a lot to learn on myself. Yeah, so what matters most here is Amaz uh, ozone, which is, uh, for those who don't know, ozone, like uh, oxygen is O2, meaning two, two oxygens yep. bound together. Ozone is three oxygens bound together. And and one is just itching to get off. One wants off so bad. <laughs> and it will oxidize the surface of whatever that it pop pops off of and attaches yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, ozone also, if you ever smelled a lightning storm. Rain, that fresh rain. That smell yeah. is ozone. It's yeah. created. Yeah, when it lightning breaks through the atmosphere, it uh, breaks up those molecules, those oxygen molecules. Creates uh, ozone. I love that smell. Uh, it smells very not, fresh. Not in my house, though. Also, ozone, a very, very popular in home. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, like uh, home fil air filtration. Yeah, the button that says ion on it yeah. is uh, ozone. It's creating ozone ions yeah. in most cases. Yeah. In fact, when you used to go to Sharper Image at the mall and you could smell what smelled like fresh air uh, or lightning storm coming out of it, it was the sea of all the, the ozone's running. Ozone generated up front called the ionic breeze. Yeah. yeah. Right? There's a, uh, I mean, that's a. Ozone is a uh, disaster or type of uh, recovery, like when you're fires in house, uh, smoking smells in cars, uh, they use ozone to pull mm. all of those smells out. To go break them down probably, yeah. 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 Mm. All right, so. But we use uh, it on the tanks. Uh, so what matters most, ozone will keep the, the tank crystal clear in a manner which you didn't know possible. 
So where carbon will generally ebb and flow, I'll mm -hmm. change the carbon, it'll get dirty, I'll change the carbon, it'll get dirty, change the carbon, it'll get, or never change the carbon, it'll Talk always about dirty. perpetual clean okay. with ozone. Yeah, ozone, man, this thing will be crystal clear 24-7, 365 days a year. You will always have <laughs> pristine, crystal clear water that highlights the corals as best as possible. You bought, you bought that Starfire glass for a reason, or that yeah. low iron glass for a reason. You got Starfire water now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so ozone will achieve that for yeah. you. Uh, what matters also most here is the tank will smell fresh as well. Hmm. Odors won't come out of this thing uh, any longer. That you know, often like a tank will have kind of like a greenish smell to it. Yeah. Uh, if you're doing it terribly, it will smell even worse. Worse, uh, <laughs> but uh, ozone will eliminate the odors that come from the tank in mm. a vast majority of cases as well. Ozone breaks down organic toxins. This is mm -hmm. that free roaming o or uh, oxygen molecule. Well, uh, or yeah, the, it will break down an organic toxin. So, like an organic toxin that comes from the ah, corals. Yeah. So if you're yeah, so if you have coral warfare, you did a whole bunch of fragging and all of that slime that you always that you see coming off of the corals because they got stressed out. Mm -hmm. Gone. Well, so in the nature, like or in the reef, like what will happen is you'll see all these corals growing like right up on top of each other, and they're all emitting a toxin to maintain their space. So like somehow, some miraculous way, they all stay about as far away yeah, from yeah, each yeah. other, right? Yeah. It's because they're emitting toxins to say, hey, get away from me, yeah. right? Well, in the ocean, they dissipate within about a half inch. Current's gone, right? right? Yeah, it's gone. Yeah, current takes it off. In an aquarium, it's just they just it's stay in there. Stagnant, it's recirculating in the up. tank. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, and it really depends on the other corals. <laughs> like, you know, this is what kind of the mixed tanks that are not, or while well, they're the most attractive tank to do, mm -hmm. they're sometimes the hardest to do, or almost always the hardest to do. Yeah. You're trying to create an environment for, a, you know, 60 different types of organisms within one tank, you know, perfect uh, no lack of toxins, lack of coral warfare, perfect lighting, perfect flow for things that don't live in the same areas at all. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. so in this case, though, uh, you'll never ever worry about organic toxins from the corals again because it will break them down into things that are not toxic. Uh, uh, also what matters most here is ozone without or BP control is a terrible, terrible idea. Mm -hmm. So you're going to want to uh, like you know, monitor ORP. Yep. So for those of you who don't know, uh, ORP is really the only thing that most people use ORP for is ozone. Yeah, I don't know if otherwise what you're going to do it for. We've, well, we've said, you know, use it you know, in the past, like if a big giant fish dies or there's some big giant dump of food in your tank or something like that, you can probably see it in, in ORP. But So ORP means oxidation reduction potential. Hmm. Potential, like it's not even a real thing. It's yeah. just the potential for something to happen, <laughs> right? Uh, okay, so the best I read is, I, if I can quote this right, is a long, long time ago, I read our Randy Holmes, our, our Farley article, and like people will tell you that ORP is generally, is a representative of how clean your water is. And he will tell you that that is not true. Mm. Uh, what ORP is, is oxidation reduction potential. So it's the ratio of amount of like organics and pollutants in the water to the amount of oxidants in the water. Mm. So if uh, I had less, I'm gonna make these numbers up, but like let's pretend I had 10 you know, pollutants in or organics in the water, I had 10 oxidants in the water. Well, these things are in balance, right? And like you'd say that that's probably fairly low pollution and I'm getting a 350 uh, ORP number or whatever mm -hmm. it is. All right, well, what if I had, instead of 10, I had 10 million pollutants in the tank? Well, now that's dirty water. Yeah. But if I also had 10 million oxidants, still I'd still balanced. get the same 350 ORP number, meaning the water isn't clear. <laughs> it's filled with 10 million pollutants. But the potential to oxidize them is the same because I have the same amount of oxidizers mm -hmm. in the water. And I'm probably butchering that, butchering that to some degree, but the reason for that is, is it's not a representative of how clean the water is. A representative of clean the water is probably you just already know how much garbage you put in there right. and how well you maintain it. Right, 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 right. Uh, but what it does do is tell you how many oxidants are in there to help combat all of the other things that you're doing. Uh, and that's why you want to have uh, the ORP controller is because if you get too many oxidants, it's going to be really bad for all the organisms in the tank. It's like breathing too much of the ionic breeze is not good for you. <laughs> uh, and uh, too, breathing too much ozone is not good for you. A little bit isn't going to harm you. You mm. see it in quality air controls and stuff when like 
you know, your city, your phone blows up and tells you don't go outside because mm -hmm. the air quality is poor. It's usually related to too much ozone yeah, in the air. Yeah. Okay, and it could be other things, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, without the ORP control, without the ability to measure the amount of oxidants to the organics. And shut it off if you're, there's an imbalance, a big point, it's right? It's an unnecessary risk. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't do it unless you're going to monitor an ORP. Uh, also, what matters most is removing the ozone from the air is a good idea. This is that carbon on the end of your reactor, on the end of your skimmer, if you're using it that way, right? Yeah, so most, uh, most people that use ozone mm -hmm. these days use it on their skimmer. Uh, I will tell you later why I don't think that's the greatest idea, but uh, they use it on their skimmer, and then all the air coming out of the top now of the skimmer actually has ozone in it. Uh, and it's really debatable. Like people will tell you ozone isn't good for you, yet like tons and tons of air filters have like, ozone. I don't have know. a button on it that produce ozone to get rid of smells in your house. Yeah. Uh, mm. So uh, it's a little bit of debate. I like to just skip the debate because if you put a bag of carbon on the top, or even like a retro, a little cup on the top of your cup of the carbon, Problem it soft. will remove the ozone, and you won't. And you can smell it. You can buy an ozone alarm if you want to do, but you can like literally smell it if it's not working. Yep. So, uh, but uh, I would do that. Yeah. I would remove it from the air. Uh, ozone reactor, better than a skimmer. Uh, basically, a chamber for ozone to interact with the water. So it's, it's probably like a, a needle wheel pump, basically almost like a skimmer, just not pulling organics. Well, there's a couple of different types of I ozone reactors. I haven't seen an ozone reactor, actually, personally. Yeah, they're rare. Yeah. And so a ozone reactor can, ozone most commonly is just somebody whips, uh, sucks ozone through the machine and into your protein skimmer and it whisks together and it works really great. There's ports on, yeah. the, in, on the Venturi made for this. Yeah, the problem is, is I've found that it destroys, you know, the performance of the protein skimmer. Ah. So it worked great at ozone, but I haven't found it to be really good. Which is at the opposite of them. what it was supposed to do, right? Yeah, the protein skimmer is supposed to pull out turds, uh, not necessarily be a reactant well, for is, ozone. Was it known that, or was it understood that, or, or, uh, that ozone oh. was supposed to ha even improve the performance of your skimmer? Okay, so <coughs> in an ideal world, right, what would happen is you'd pull in just the right amount of ozone into your skimmer. Mm. And in that case, what would happen is you've got a bunch of organics in there that may be positively, negatively charged, and it will change some of those things over mm. into something that's more likely to attach to a bubble, right? Yeah. But if you use too much ozone, it will change them all over to something, or I shouldn't say attach to a bubble, attach themselves uh, and create larger organic molecules, which to are easier to for bubbles. the yeah. bubble to remove. Yeah. Okay, but if you change all of them, well, then they repel from each other, and it makes it harder for uh, the skimmer to uh. remove. Uh, it's been my case that trying to m walk that balance uh, has not been productive for yeah. me, and most of the time when I put ozone on a skimmer, it actually reduces the skimmer's performance. Uh, that is, I, and I've done it quite a few times now, yeah. uh, and I, every time it's been that case. <laughs> so in that spirit, there's two types reactor. of uh, ozone reactors. One, you can go get an uh, ozone reactor that's really complex, uh, meaning uh, usually what they would do is fill it with some, some chamber, and they'd fill it with this bio bale. Down. They'll trickle water yeah. over it. You'll pump uh, ozone into it. You'll use an air pump to put it under two or three PSI, so there's actual osmotic pressure pushing the ozone essentially into, into the, the thin mold. layer yeah. of water. Yeah and it will work really awesome and be a giant pain in the butt to maintain. <laughs> uh, I think actually what I would do if I was gonna run ozone at this point is I'd buy the cheapest skimmer I can find. A little tiny guy. Uh, a little cheap, cheap, cheap skimmer and just yeah. uh, set it up to never skim anything. Yeah. I have a real skimmer and then I have the skimmer over here that's just whisking ozone in and, and, and you know, solving my problem that way. Yeah. Really, really easy. Doesn't affect my skimmer, and I don't have to maintain this bio bale pressure, all this other garbage. Well, if you use a, if you use a secondary uh, skimmer uh, for this purpose, then rather than configuring the top of that skimmer lid for carbon or something, I just take the lid off and put carbon right there in the neck. Oh, done. done. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Cut the little putter out, put a bag of carbon in there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you could retrofit the thing <clears throat> super easy that way. Yeah. You're not going to ever have it skim. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, all right. So uh, hard lessons, though, with ozone. 
is one, in relation to what you just said, mm -hmm. is wet carbon doesn't work very well at removing ozone in my experience. So if the skimmer produces so much moisture that eventually all the carbon just gets like soaked in water, it doesn't produce the ozone smell or amount of ozone into the room. So this long. is this is carbon in the air on the air on the output of the of the reactor or the skimmer, not carbon yeah. at the actual underwater at the water output of the skimmer. Yeah, usually what people will do, and uh, you can debate <coughs> whether both of these things need to be done, and we're going to debate that in just a second. Is does uh, most people will attempt to remove the ozone from you know, the output of the skimmer on both ends. The air that's coming out the top of the skimmer cup, right. uh, as well as the water that's coming out of the skimmer. Like, I want to protect the house from the ozone, and I also, or the people that live in it, I also want to protect uh, the fish inhabitants from ozone going into the water. Okay, so if you put the carbon on the top and eventually it gets soaked in water, it doesn't work that well at yeah. pulling out the ozone. Again, you'll know because it smells. You can also buy a little alarm if you want. Hmm. Uh, the part that I've never really bought into, and I, and I can't tell you whether I'm right or wrong in this, I just haven't bought into the carbon on the output of the underwater. reactor yeah. or the skimmer that's underwater because, A, it didn't remove the ozone very well from when the carbon is wet in air. Uh, B, the half-life of ozone, like it literally is three oxygens, and one of them is desperately trying to get off. As soon as it hits that it, water. As soon as yeah. it hits seawater that's filled with organics, Some like a dirty aquarium, charged, yeah. the chances of it popping <coughs> off and the half-life of it Still in cold. the aquarium is probably really, really, really low. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and uh, another point actually, is that, uh, I think we'll hit on this one, but I'll share it now anyway, is a lot of carbon is actually like dust. It's like, if it, when it, if it comes in a pellet, obviously the carbon didn't come out of the ground as a pellet. Right, right, right. Right, so the carbon actually has been the coal and they carbonize it and they crush it up and then they glue it back together in these little pellets. pellets. Well, the problem with ozone is it can actually eat the binder on the pellet, oh, okay. right? And yeah. so it will. It will. It depends on the binder that you use, and it depends on uh, you know, like the some carbon is actually like the little granules. Like the sad part is actually even the broken up little granules. That is also sometimes powdered and glued back together, <laughs> uh, and so you don't really know. But like. I haven't found the perfect carbon that won't fall apart uh, from you know putting carbon on the output of the reactor or the skimmer mm. without breaking up the binder and like I haven't really tested that many of them. I just don't know and I, there's so many unknowns here. You can start to see like at the beginning of it, I always get really excited about the ozone conversation. Yeah, yeah. By the end of it, I'm like ah, I don't just don't know. Still don't know. Yeah. Uh, it is still like a little bit of uh, you know trailblazing yeah. here, even though it's been around for decades. <laughs> Frontier to travel down. Uh, hard lesson learned here is uh, you'd feel better with an ozone alarm. I'd feel better with an ozone alarm. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're cheap is the problem. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you so you get an alarm Depot. that actually tells you how much ozone's in the <clears> room and it's like a fire alarm. Yeah. Uh, Probably not the cheapest things. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think they're particularly cheap. If they are, somebody should post huh. one. Uh, also, a hard lesson though: no one knows the effect of ozone on livestock, uh, and I'm not confident that the carbon actually removes removes it. the yeah. The only piece I'd say I've seen people run carbon ozone on a lot of different systems, including I watched them do it at Live Aquaria, and the corals and the fish are doing just fine. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have a tendency to not believe that. Uh, uh, the ozone is actually harming any of the livestock in the water, but nobody really knows. So there's always that like that question in the back of your head, you know? Yeah. You know what the effect <laughs> of that is. Uh, there you go. Uh, if I have carbon on the output, do I even need ozone? Yeah, like carbon is. Uh, well, is this the binder? If it's eating up the binder, then what's the point? Or if well, the carbon's doing the exact same thing, cleaning the water, taking away the smell of the tank, do I need ozone? That is the part, it's three bucks in carbon, is removing the smell and making it crystal clear as well. It's just doing just it on an ebb and flow process. Yep. The benefit of the ozone is that it always keeps it there, yeah. right? But if I'm doing this really well and I'm putting all this carbon on the output of the skimmer, or uh, output of the ozone reactor in the water that's going through it, why am I messing around with the ozone? I'm still using carbon. <laughs> I, I don't get it, right? So. 
yes, it'll be more smooth and whatever. I, this is where you can see this start to fall apart yeah. for me. Like, yeah. I, I really want this to work. I really like the idea of crystal clear 24-7. I really like the idea of no odor, but then, like, I can what the hell am I doing? The three bucks of carbon point versus uh, air desiccant and the generator and changing your corona discharge and oh, all Oh, yeah, I'm going to be into this for 600 bucks, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> for sure. Secondary skimmer. Yeah, I, I don't know. This okay. Ne this next one kind of feeds that for you, too. Yeah, okay, so it's if I had ozone on the output, do I even need ozone? Uh, and ozone never even helped my skimmer before. Both of those things we already kind of covered. Yeah. You know, so in the end, I'd be dying to know if you guys would consider ozone. Do you think it's something that, uh, is it even worth Randy and I like Exploring? diving into with yeah. BRS TV Investigates and finding out the answers? Or is three bucks in carbon the real solution and this is just like some white fairy tale we're chasing? I know my answer. I'll, I'll use carbon. I, I, <laughs> I mean, I'm a gear <sighs> junkie, so it's like the calcium reactor thing. Do I really need a calcium reactor when I can just put five gallons of two-part in there and put some trace and minor elements inside and I'm done? Uh, do I need all that calcium reactor gear and all that? Well, no, but I really like it because I'm a gear junkie and I like to fiddle with all that type of stuff. If you could give me 100% confidence that it was both safe for my house and my household as well as safe for all the fish and coral in there, I'd use it for sure. Mm -hmm. Like I, I would, I don't, I want to eliminate the ebbs and flows. I want it to be crystal clear all the time. I never want it to smell. And so, if you could give me the confidence in it, so the question really is: is could BRSTV investigates give us that level of confidence? And it's something that we'll have to think about. Yeah. If you guys got ideas for experiments, uh, share them in the comments. Yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely. So the big question is: what's next? Well, up next is day seven that it will be covering uh, the episodes 29 through 34. That's like six, seven episodes. So we're going to be talking all about alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, calcium reactors, trace elements, per water parameters, test kits, and uh, a bonus missing episode from the 52 weeks that uh, should have been put in there all about pH. That's coming up in day seven of the 11 days of reefing. And I would say that we would see you tomorrow, but tomorrow is actually Thanksgiving, so we won't. Uh, but we'll see you the day after that.